Okay, so good morning, everyone. If I can just ask you to take your seat. Thank you very much. We're going to begin the uh, first meeting of this new term of the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee. Uh, I would like to uh, begin this meeting uh, by acknowledging um, that uh, we are gathered here on the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, and the Wendat people. And Toronto is now home to still many Indigenous uh, First Nations Métis peoples. And we also acknowledge and recognize that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, welcome to everyone who's come to our meeting today and to those who are returning members of the committee, uh, as well as our very new members and to members of the public and to those from the Toronto Public Service who are joining us uh, for this uh, morning meeting. Uh, you can follow the agenda and debate on the computer, the tablet, or the smartphone at www.toronto.ca backslash council. Um, my name is Kristen Wong Tam, the chair of the committee, and I would be asking at this point in time, are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Okay, seeing none. Um, if you do have a, a declaration of interest that you would like to declare under the Municipal Conflict of Interest uh, Act, uh, just as a reminder, you need to file a written declaration uh, with the clerk who is actually sitting on my right-hand side, and uh, you will be submitting that form uh, and completing that before the end of the meeting. And then, of course, declaring your interest uh, at, the, at the start of the item. So um, what we do at the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee, we generally want to start our meeting with a round of introductions. And because there are so many uh, new faces, um, we want to make sure that there's an opportunity for everyone to know who's also uh, in the room. So what I'm going to do at this point in time is just invite everybody uh, to introduce themselves, starting with the inner uh, horseshoe uh, seating table. Uh, if you can just state your name to our new members, uh, state your name. If you're representing an organization, we like to hear that as well, as well as um, just giving us a sentence or two about yourself. And then after the introduction of our inner um, horseshoe table, we're going to also hear from those who are in the room, so uh, so you will know exactly uh, who's uh, who's actually participating in our meeting today. Uh, you'll find that directly in front of you is a microphone. Uh, there is also a button. When you uh, hit that button or press that button, the red light will go on. And that will indicate that your microphone is hot. Okay, so be careful if you uh, you're talking to your neighbor about lunch and you know things about have to happen last night. You want to make sure your microphone is off, which means your light is off. Um, should I begin on my left hand side? Go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Yin Brown, accessibility consultant uh, in the department called People, Equity, and Human Rights. Glenn Hart, a uh, returning member, um, but barely, uh, I was a late addition last year. Um, I work for Fife House um, in Food and Nutrition Program, supportive housing for people with HIV. Miranda Frey, I'm a new member. I'm a site manager of Toronto District School Board Next Steps Employment Centre at Riverdale. Stephanie Marinich Lee, I'm a new member as well. Um, I represent myself, <laughs> and um, uh, uh, previously, in my previous life, I was a lawyer and worked for uh, uh, different organizations all pertaining to uh, issues around people with disabilities. Great. Thank you, Stephanie. And let's go over there to Michael. Hey, hi, I'm Michael Michelli. I'm a returning member, um, and uh, I have a lived experience as a person with a disability. I have a master's degree in critical disability studies, and my research interests are the ethical and social implications of new reproductive technologies. Hi, everyone. My name is Wendy Porch. Uh, I am also a returning member of the committee. Um, I'm the executive director at the Centre for Independent Living in Toronto, uh, also known as SILT. Um, before I worked at SILT, I did quite a lot of work around episodic disability. Uh, I was the um, manager of the Episodic Disabilities Network, and I worked at an organization called Realize. And I'm thrilled to be back. Thank you. Great. Hi there, my name is Karima Ewig. Um, I, uh, I'm a new member to the committee. 
Um, I have a lived experience as a person with a disability as well as I work in the developmental sector uh, field uh, at a group home and at a day program. Hello, my name is Michelle Grimley Petridis. I also come from the developmental services sector, working with Community Living Toronto as a community support coordinator and also on their diversity and inclusion projects. I'm a new member, so thank you for having me. And I also have a background in critical disability studies as well as lived experience. Thank you. Hi, I'm Liv Mendelson. I'm a new member. Thank you for having me. I am the Director of Accessibility and Inclusion at the Miles Nadal JCC and the Artistic Director of the Real Abilities Toronto Film Festival. I also have lived experience of invisible disability. Great. Thank you, Liv. I'm Carol Costin and I work with the City Clerk's Office. I'm a committee administrator and I help provide meeting support for your committee. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jennifer Ling. I'm the committee secretary for this committee. I'm very happy to work with all of you, and I look forward to a good term. Thank you. Hi, Lynn Genova. It's nice to be working with this committee, and I think I can say this is my favorite committee. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Katisha McGregor, and I am with the city clerk's office as a support B assistant, and I'm glad to be here today. Hi, morning everyone. Uh, Max Greenwald in the city manager's office as a senior consultant. Hi, good morning. My name is Robin Shilot. I'm with the city's public consultation unit and I've been supporting the on-street bike design guidelines that will be presented today. I am Jennifer Highland. I'm in cycling infrastructure and transportation at the city and I'm also uh, with the on-street bikeway design guidelines presentation today. Good morning, Jason Neudorf. I'm with uh, consulting firm WSP, and I'll be delivering the presentation about the on-street bikeway design guidelines. Thank you. And if we can just proceed to the back of the room. I am Adam Comfort, Thank you, and let's head to this side of the room then. My name is Dylan Feist, I'm with Municipal Licensing and Standards, um, and we'll be uh, seeking accessibility feedback on the Vehicle for Hire accessibility strategy today. Good morning, Marcia Stoltz, Manager of Vehicle for Hire, Municipal Licensing and Standards. Good morning, I'm Fiona Chapman, I'm the Director of Business Licensing and uh, Regulatory Services in MLS. It's uh, Matthew Green from City Clerk's Office. Uh, I'm, we're, I'm here to uh, help arrange for the captioning and to, because she is writing right now and will be able to introduce herself, I'll introduce uh, our captioner at the back of the room who will be uh, working for today. Hi, I'm Fortis Chu, Support Assistant B at uh, City Clerk's Office. Great, thank you, and over here. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mazen Aribi. I'm the ACAT Chair. ACAT stands for Advisory Committee on Accessible Transit, and I'm here as an observer. Thank you. Thank you, Mazen. And uh, at the front of the room. Uh, no, sorry, sir. It's uh, our, our captioner. Thank you very much. And um, thank you everyone for your participation in that exercise. I think it's important for us to all know who's actually in the room and thank you very much for identifying yourself in such a good way. Um, we do have an agenda that we need to go through the formal adoptions of and uh, just by way of, uh, of doing so, I'm going to uh, read out the title of the, uh, the, um, uh, each item. And uh, if there are presentations, we will hold them and staff will present to us or, or any overviews. Uh, and if there is no action required, we can simply just move to adopt that agenda item. Uh, so DI 1.1, which is also the chair's report, we're gonna hold that and I'll provide my presentation shortly. Uh, DI 1.2, which is the mandate of the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee and the meeting processes and procedures, we're gonna hold that also for presentation. D1.3, uh, election of vice chairs. Uh, we will go through that because we're going to have to do some actions. Uh, we will hold that. Uh, 
DI 1.4, accessibility feedback on vehicle for higher accessibility strategy. We're also gonna hold that item for presentation. DI 1.5, accessibility review on street bikeway design guidelines. We will also hold that matter uh, for presentation. So we've got a very full uh, agenda. I also note that we have a registered deputant to speak to that item. DI 1.6, accessibility review. Toronto Vision 02.0, Road Safety Plan, uh, we will be holding that matter for presentation. Uh, DI 1.7, Accessibility Feedback on Preparing the City of Toronto for Automated Vehicles, we will also hold that for presentation. DI 1.8, the title Improving Representation of Persons with Disabilities on City Boards, Committees and Tribunals. Uh, this is a letter from myself to the committee um, suggesting that the City Clerk work with the Executive Director of uh, People, Equity and Human Rights and Key Stakeholder um, to report back to our committee in September 2019 with a strategy to strengthen the recruitment and civic appointment selection process for public appointments on our city boards, committees and tribunals and of course uh, with the goal of increasing representation of persons with disabilities and striving toward equitable representation by the year 2025. Uh, if there are no um, speakers on that item, uh, my recommendation is that we would just adopt it unless somebody wants to hold to ask questions of the, the mover. No? Seeing none, then I will simply just move uh, the letter. We can all indicate a show of support. And if you do that, then that is adopted. Thank you very much. That brings us to the end of the formal agenda. So uh, back to item number one, back to the top, which is the chair's report. I think we're going to proceed that way. Um, so, just uh, by way of um, uh, stating a purpose for this uh, this committee, we are in the middle of a new term, and uh, everyone already knows this. But because this uh, this meeting is being broadcast through the closed circuit uh, cameras for the rest of uh, those who are in the building, uh, under the Ontarians with Disabilities Act, every municipality of 10,000 people uh, and more have to have, must have, an Accessibility Advisory Committee. And the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee here fulfills this requirement for the City of Toronto. The Advisory Committee provides advice to City Council on the elimination of barriers faced by people with disabilities and acts as a liaison with external uh, bodies on barriers uh, to participation in public life and to the achievement of social, cultural, and economic well-being of people with disabilities. Uh, this committee, our great committee, also provides advice to City Council about the requirements and implementations of accessibility standards uh, and the preparation, implementation, and effectiveness of the accessibility reports as required by the Accessibilities uh, for Ontarians with Disability Act. So that is, in a essence, our mandate. Um, and we've, uh, we've been doing that uh, for some time now. Um, the, the rest of my report is going through um, a, a few things. Uh, what I generally do is highlight some of the things that I would have um, uh, undertaken and performed uh, as the chair of the committee so you folks will know what Kristen is up to in between our meetings. Um, and then, of course, also to hear uh, from uh, yourselves about any of the advocacy uh, additional work that you'd like us to take. Um, so some of it is directions from uh, the committee who says, Chair, I want you to go off and do this. And some of it is just things by, by way of invitations through the office. Um, so I'm very pleased to say uh, that the motion that you've just adopted, uh, which is 1.8, uh, was specifically feedback from a from a meeting that was held um, through the um, uh, Civics Appointments Office asking us to do an even stronger and better job to make sure we had a broader, more equitable representation from people from our community. Um, so that was, uh, that was the outcome of that request. Um, on March the 5th, 2019, uh, I know that Mason, you were also there, um, we attended the St. Patrick's TTC Station Accessible Entrance uh, Grand Open and Celebration. Uh, the St. Patrick's Subway Station became the 45th of TTC's 75 stations to provide accessible access uh, to the subway station. Uh, this accessible entrance is now located at 480 University Avenue, which is located at the northwest corner of University and Dundas. The elevators connected the street to the concourse levels and of course to the subway platforms, uh, and the entrance included uh, weather protected stairs, because we don't want those stairs to be slippery. Um, it also actually um, will uh, include a broad public uh, art consultation um, 
uh, installation by Barbara Todd, um, representing many little plans is the title. And if you are able to sort of take a look very carefully, you may even see yourself captured in those images. Um, and uh, there'll be two more stations, DuPont and Royal York, uh, that are scheduled for completion in 2019. Uh, and all of this is the TTC's program to provide uh, full accessibility by 2025 under uh, their easier access program. On April the 2nd, I was uh, in attendance for the World Autism Awareness Day. We raised the flag on the rooftop at the City Council, City Hall for the very first time. Uh, I was able to deliver some remarks and greetings on behalf of the committee. Um, during this uh, past uh, budget debate, uh, there were probably lots of conversations, I know that I certainly heard them, about the quality of snow removal and clearance on roadways, on pedestrian rights of way, on transit stops in front of uh, schools, uh, in front of daycares, just about everywhere, uh, snow Armageddon hit Toronto, and we didn't seem to be very well equipped to uh, to address that. Um, the City of Toronto received a record number of, uh, of complaints this winter uh, regarding snow clearing. Um, on March the 7th, during a very special um, uh, budget session, City Council directed Transportation Services to, provide, to provide a report to the 2020 Budget Committee, uh, the budget process, uh, to ensure that we can enhance winter maintenance service. And included in the list of recommendations were directions to explore the cost related to the delivery of enhanced snow clearing on the following sidewalks on residential streets in every single neighborhood in Toronto, pathways and parks, enforcement of parking that obstructs TTC and bike lanes, and the cost of incre increasing the amount of snow removal uh, citywide. Uh, all of that work uh, had the support of Mayor and City Council moving forward. So I think that this committee, um, you should be advised, and the community who's uh, very interested in, in improving accessibility across the city, we're going to need your advocacy to come out during the budget process because all of this will have a cost and um, we're going to have to explain why it's worth it. Uh, and then finally, the upcoming and ongoing consultations for the Vehicle for Hire review. There's an opportunity for members to provide input. The City of Toronto is reviewing the licensing uh, for vehicles for hire by law. It's been underway for some time. Staff are here to, today to provide additional um, uh, feedback. Uh, you'll be invited to, uh, to come out and give us your feedback on taxis, uh, limousines, private transportation, uh, such, uh, companies such as Lyft and Uber. The review is aimed to explore the topic of accessibility, uh, vehicle equipment and public safety. It also includes results from a congestion management plan and it, uh, it also talks up, uh, to the economic impact study. Uh, your feedback is going to be critically uh, important. Um, and there, that report is going to generate, your feedback is going to be contained in a report that will be going back to General Managing and Licensing Committee in 2019. Um, and for those who are wheelchair accessible users, uh, there is also an online survey. The city is looking for better, to better uh, understand the demand and experience of wheelchair accessible uh, taxi cabs, and there will be a survey available. Uh, the survey deadline is April 30th, and you can find that survey on the city's uh, website. So that concludes uh, my formal portion of the chair's report. I'd like to invite uh, Stephen Reynolds to provide an overview of the fire uh, safety information, uh, which is also part of the chair's report. Welcome, Stephen. Um, so I'm just going to give a, just a brief synopsis of what would happen uh, in case of a fire alarm uh, pertaining to this uh, particular fire. Um, just for anybody that doesn't know, security will announce that an alarm has been activated in the uh, sp a specific area of the building. They will ask for the affected, affected areas uh, staff to leave the building. Uh, should the evacuation be requir required for the committee room, all occupants, staff and public will exit out the doors that are marked by the exit signs here in the room. Uh, these doors... Uh, Sorry. The doors would lead staff and public to hallways hosting stairwells used to evacuate the building. The east doors uh, will lead you to public circular staircase which will take occupants to the ground floor main entrance of City Hall. The north door behind us leads you to a northeast stairwell taking you to the ground floor uh, Hegem exit which leads you to the back of the building. Uh, in our fire plan it's recommended that persons who use mobility devices uh, remain in place in the room. Uh, 
if there's no immediate danger, such as any detectable smoke, uh, any usual odors or fire, uh, this is a determination by security. Uh, if security makes a secondary announcement uh, for all to evacuate, persons who use uh, mobility devices uh, are asked to move to areas of refuge here on the floor, and the, um, the areas of refuge are designated as the um, southeast and southwest stairwells uh, of the towers. Uh, so we're asking you to go to these locations because there are emergency telephones at these stairwells uh, that you can contact security who will be manning the uh, fire panel during any alarm. Uh, we're also asking if there's any persons uh, with a disability who's alone, uh, he or she should uh, phone 911 and give their uh, present location, including floor level and the need uh, assistance or the designated area of re refuge where they're heading to. So that was just, that is just briefly what would happen in a fire alarm situation in this room. Thank you. My microphone back on. Thank you very much, Stephen, for the, uh, the presentation and the overview. Um, are there any questions uh, about either Stephen's presentation or perhaps the chair's report? Uh, Liv? And just by way of, um, uh, of information, uh, we generally time the, uh, the question period and the answer period to five minutes, and then there's an opportunity to speak. So go ahead, please. I'll be very brief. <laughs> go ahead. Um, <clears throat> I'm pleased to see that the city raised the flag for World Autism Awareness Day. Uh, it's also um, Autism Acceptance Month, which is similar and related. And I'm wondering if there are any plans to raise the neurodiversity flag or if there are any connections. Um, it's a separate but similar uh, initiative. Um, so j just a question, something we can look at. Yes, thank you very much, Liv, for the question. Um, I do not have an answer to that at this point in time. We will check with the pro protocol office. Uh, generally, community organizations can make the requests uh, to raise any particular flag and to uh, put together a community gathering where there are formal remarks that are delivered. Um, I'm just not sure if, uh, if that's on the calendar. It may or may not be. Uh, but I can uh, perhaps get that answer for, for you uh, before the end of uh, the meeting. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions uh, about the chair's report or Stephen's uh, presentation? Okay, seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Oh. oh, sorry, Michael, I didn't see your hand. Okay, go ahead, please. I have a quick question about Stephen's report, though. Um, in the event of a fire emergency, are the elevators automatically shut down or are they still working? No, the elevators go on to recall, so any elevators, any of the east tower or the west tower elevators will ground to the first floor, and the specific elevators will ground to the basement for firefighters. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much, Stephen. Um, if I can just have someone move to adopt the, oh, sorry, to receive the uh, chair's report. Okay, thank you, Glenn. All those in favor? Okay, thank you. Any opposed? Seeing none, no opposed. Right? Great. Great, thank you very much, folks. Uh, item number two, mandate of the Acce Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee and meeting processes and procedures. Uh, Carol is uh, setting up. Uh, we will be receiving a presentation. Okay, so we'll give a few minutes for that uh, technical turnover. Um, just uh, by way of introduction, uh, Victoria is uh, here. Where is... Victoria. Uh, Victoria is our attendant. Uh, I don't. Uh, oh, okay, okay. So, so uh, even though I can't see Victoria, Victoria is right here. Um, Victoria, if you don't mind just uh, letting us know who you are, thank you so much. Victoria is the attendant care service uh, provider today. So, if anybody needs uh, any supports, please let us know. Uh, and if anyone who is interested in a glass of water, just raise your hand. We will get it to you. And, uh, and of course, Marlene Finnegan, thank you for. Uh, for captioning. Okay, super. I think I ran the clock long enough, and Carol, you're ready? <laughs> okay. Go ahead, proceed when you're ready. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, so Carol and I are gonna present on this item to talk about the mandate of TAC and meeting procedures. Uh, I'm gonna start off just a bit about um, uh, what a council advisor body is and where you fit into the broader governance structure and committee structure at the city, uh, and talk a little bit more about the mandate um, following up on Councillor Wong Tam's overview. So what is a council advisory body? Um, 
these are deliberative bodies set up by council to provide advice on uh, specific issues. Um, they're formed uh, at the will of council, um, exception being uh, Toronto Accessibility Advisory Council, um, as mentioned, is, is a requirement under AODA. Um, and they receive input uh, from the public, um, uh, industry, stakeholders, um, different sectors on key policy issues to provide uh, recommendations to council. Um, important to note that uh, cabs don't deliver services and that they don't directly uh, direct city staff, rather provide recommendations to the appropriate standing committee or council who would then provide that direction to staff. Um, and that all cabs include a member of council and then the rest of membership made up of at least 50% of uh, public members. Um, and we have a listing out of the other uh, cabs on the right-hand side there, if you're curious. Um, so I'm just going to talk a bit about the terms of reference of tax. So this was just adopted by council at its last meeting uh, at the end of March. Um, uh, I'm just going to talk about the purpose of TAC in the terms of reference and also a bit about the governance. Um, so as we've mentioned, it's a requirement under AODA. Um, and the mandate of TAC uh, is to provide advice to City Council uh, on the following issues and, uh, or sorry, matters. Um, those are requirements and implementation of AODA accessibility standards, uh, preparation of accessibility reports, um, and all other matters that Council may seek advice um, on uh, as required uh, through AODA. Um, to provide uh, advice on all functions related to the integrated accessibility standards regulation. Um, so those include things like the city's multi-year accessibility plan, um, proportion of on-demand accessible taxi cabs, recreation trails, uh, outdoor play spaces, rest areas on exterior paths of travel, um, and on-street parking spaces. Um, also to provide advice on the prevention and elimination of barriers faced by persons with disability um, in order to achieve accessibility with respect to uh, things the city does. So those include things like bylaws, policies, goods and services, our programs, employment facilities, buildings, um, as well as identifying and preventing uh, and removing barriers to the participation of persons with disabilities um, in public life in the city. Uh, and finally, advancing achievement of social, cultural, uh, economic well-being of persons with disabilities. Um, if we could move on to the next slide. Uh, in terms of governance, um, high-level information here, but as I mentioned, um, TAC provides uh, advice to the City Council through Executive Committee or an appropriate Standing Committee. Um, as Carol will get into in, in more detail, uh, TAC operates in accordance with Council's simplified uh, procedures for advisory bodies in terms of how the committee will run. Um, all meetings are open um, and have to follow open meeting requirements as per the City of Toronto Act. Uh, six meetings are held per year at the call of the chair um, and the committee is supported by staff in the People, Equity and Human Rights Division as well as the City Clerk's Office. Uh, and so you understand, I won't go through this in uh, great detail, but just so the members understand where they fit into the um, broader committee structure. Uh, so what we have is the committee structure of council. Uh, with City Council uh, at the top, obviously, and then a number of special, uh, special committees that report to City Council. Um, we have uh, a group of standing committees uh, that deal with policy matters uh, and meet more regularly. Um, community councils, which are geographic-based uh, councils across the city and have some delegated uh, authority to make decisions on uh, local and neighborhood matters. And executive committee, uh, where uh, TAC reports in through which also has a special committee that reports to it, uh, which is budget committee. And so where does TAC fit into the whole decision-making process? Um, this is an overview, uh, a bit simplified overview of decision-making at the city. Um, main takeaways here is that uh, all decisions really start at uh, uh, community councils and standing committees, and there are a number of inputs into community councils and standing committees. So those include proposals from uh, members of city council, reports from city staff, uh, reports from agencies and corporations, and then recommendations from council advisory bodies such as yourself. Uh, community councils can make some final decisions, uh, otherwise uh, decisions are, are brought forward to city council as recommendations, where uh, city council makes that final decision and then uh, is put into action, whether through a bylaw or a confirming decision. 
and the public has opportunities to in, be involved throughout the process. So um, through public consultations, through deputations at standing committees, um, by attending meetings of city council and, and watching meetings um, uh, as they're streamed through YouTube, and also by commenting on city services directly to city staff, councillors, or through 311. And from there, I'll turn it over to Carol to talk a bit more about meeting procedures for the committee. Thank you. Uh, the simplified rules of procedure were recently approved by council, and I think a copy was also uh, provided to you with your agenda. While all advisory bodies are established under Chapter 27, uh, City Council procedures, those procedures contain a lot more rules than an advisory body requires to conduct a meeting. So the simplified rules maintain the principles of the Council procedures, but omits uh, some of the rules that apply only to City Council. As Max mentioned, all uh, meetings are open open to the public, notice must be given, and all consideration and debate takes place at the meeting. And meetings are streamed online with closed captioning. While all meetings are open to the public, uh, a committee may close a meeting if the subject of debate falls under one of several exemptions to the open meeting rules. And those are actually legislated in the City of Toronto Act and they're listed in your simplified rules. An example might be an advisory committee that is considering details related to the acquisition or disposal of land, employee negotiations, or perhaps uh, something that is subject to solicitor client privilege. Those are just a few examples um, from the list. Agendas. Um, agenda items must be within the advisory body's terms of reference um, and submitted in writing to the committee secretary by the agenda closing deadline from any of the following. A member of the advisory body uh, from city council, from a city council committee, from a local board of the city, or from city staff. And it's important uh, if anyone is considering submitting an, an item for an agenda to plan well in advance because the agenda closing deadline is 10 business days prior to the meeting. So about two weeks before the meeting. And city clerk's office is available to assist people with questions about how to format items for the agenda. And city manager's program staff um, are available to uh, answer questions about content for agenda items. Max mentioned um, about how the committee gives advice. So, Committee may, may make recommendations to city officials on matters within their jurisdiction for consideration or recommendations to a council committee for consideration or recommendations directly to city council for a matter that is on their agenda. A recommendation that requires action by city officials or council first has to be considered by the appropriate council committee and then afterwards, when necessary, approved by council. So, um, a decision that you make today that requires further approvals may not be final until it actually ends up at City Council. The committee must make a decision on every item on your agenda. The committee may decide to receive the item for information, as you've done with one of your items today. You may defer the item to a future meeting. You may provide advice for consideration, as discussed in the previous slide, um, or provide a recommendation to a council committee or city council. And decisions are made by voting on a proposal contained in a motion. And some motions are straightforward. The chair will read the motion aloud, um, for example, like to receive an item for information. Um, otherwise, city clerk staff, we are here to assist members uh, with preparing motions as required. Motions are typed and displayed and should be read aloud so that all members hear and understand the proposal. And then the chair will also rule any motions with or not, which are not within the mandate of the committee out of order. The order of business at, at a meeting, which you're getting familiar with today, uh, the chair will call the meeting to order once quorum is present. Um, quorum for this committee is a majority of the members. And in the simplified rules now, uh, 
the meeting must have quorum within 30 minutes of the time the meeting was called for. So the meeting was scheduled for 9.30, and quorum must be present by 10 a.m., for example. The next thing that happens is the chair will ask for declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, and then would ask for a confirmation of minutes of the last meeting. That didn't happen today since it's the first meeting of the term. The chair then reviews all the items on the agenda, and some of the items can be disposed of uh, right at the top of the agenda. Other items are held down, such as items with presentations or items with public speakers, as the chair did today. Then the committee considers each item on its own, and when the agenda is complete, the chair adjourns the meeting. So there's no uh, motion required for adjournment. On each item, the chair announces the item, and then the next thing that would happen is a staff presentation, if there is one. Not every item would have a staff presentation. The next thing would be any public speakers who have registered in advance, the chair would call them forward to address the committee, and after they're done, you may have questions of those public speakers. Then the chair will ask members of the committee if you have any questions of staff on the item. And then following that, uh, members may make remarks, uh, make comments, and make any motions on the item. And at the end, the committee votes on motions and the decision is made. For voting, all members present must vote. And a majority vote is required to pass a motion. Motion would fail if, if the vote is tied. And members may vote by a show of hands or may ask to have the vote recorded in the minutes. For minutes, uh, minutes are prepared without note and comment. They include motions, votes, decisions, and attendance. And minutes are provided to members uh, by email and also posted online, uh, similar with your agendas and all other meeting information. And uh, our online website, uh, there's a link here and we can also send it to you. Uh, Jennifer's been sending you a lot of emails um, so that you become familiar with where all the information is for the committee online on our TMMIS website, our meeting management website. And uh, through that website, you can also subscribe to receive information, e-updates on related to this committee, any other council committee or city council itself. So anytime a notice or an agenda is posted, you would receive an email. As members, of course, you'll, you will be emailed by Jennifer, but that's an, an extra uh, service that's provided that you should be aware of. And your, your main contacts in the clerk's office would be Jennifer Lynn, your committee secretary, and myself, and we work together as a team. And that's the end of our presentation. Thank you very much, Carol, for the presentation. Um, are there any questions from our committee members about the presentation? Uh, Stephanie, and then Wendy. Hi. Sorry, it's uh, just a quick question. It was just relating to when you're uh, talking about voting. I just wasn't sure, and I wanted clarification, if uh, does Councillor uh, Wong Tam have a vote? Is she considered a member? Yes, the chair is a member of the committee and the chair also votes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Wendy? Thank you for the presentation. It was very clear and straightforward. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, the working groups. So in a previous term, we did have working groups as part of this committee, but I haven't seen them mentioned in terms of the overview that you provided. Mm -hmm. The uh, topic of working groups was re reviewed with the city clerk's office and city manager's office. And by definition, a working group is actually a subcommittee of the main committee. And in the procedure bylaw, um, the, a subcommittee uh, by an advisory body would have to be approved by city council in order to exist. And the subcommittee would, uh, so it would, it would go forward as a recommendation from the committee and it would have, uh, have to list the, the terms of reference, the purpose and the membership. And typically subcommittees would be created to study a specific issue or item that the committee feels is necessary for extra consideration. And if a subcommittee is created, it is subject to all the meeting rules and the different proceedings that I went over in my presentation. So 
the clerk's office would prepare the agenda, we would meet in a public meeting space, and the subcommittee would conduct its meetings in accordance with the open rules. Michael, go ahead, please. Okay, thank you for the presentation. I have a quick question. What happens to motions afterwards? And I mean, I'm still fairly new, so, um, you know, say a motion is done in terms of a recommendation, what happens there in terms of follow-up? Okay, um, there are many different types of motions. Um, so a motion to adopt an item, once it's carried, we, if the item has a recommendation in it, so for example, Councillor Wontam's letter on today's agenda, um, her the motion was to adopt her recommendation, so that recommendation becomes a decision. And as the secretary of the committee, Jennifer Lynn will send that decision up to the executive committee for consideration. Executive committee then will consider it and and it becomes a decision once they adopt it. There may be other types of motions that when they go up to committee, um, they may re require council approval. So there may be uh, something at this committee, you make, you adopt it and it goes forward to executive committee and they adopt it and then it goes up to city council for decision. And these things are all uh, posted online in the different uh, decision bodies on our TMMIS system. So you're, you'd be welcome to look at, follow your decision, your recommendation, and how it's going up through the, uh, uh, through the decision-making process. Okay. Uh, the reason why I was asking, I was just thinking about some of the motions that have been made, just in terms of where the follow-up was to see if things were happening, especially in terms of, say, AODA requirements, were city divisions meeting those requirements or not? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. If you have any questions about specific items, you can email us and we can let you know how to search those online. Okay. Okay, um, are there any other questions? I, and if you have questions, try to keep them all together so we don't have to open up for a second round. And I think, Wendy, we're gonna do that for you right now. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate the, the courtesy. Uh, I have a follow-up question on the working groups. So is it possible for this uh, council, for this committee rather, to form a working group, should we feel that there's one necessary? And I'm asking because we, we did have a number of working groups that were fairly active, and so it's unclear to me uh, going forward if that's still an option for us. A working, um, it would be called a subcommittee as opposed to a working group, and an item would have to come forward on an, on an agenda, and um, as I mentioned, you would state the uh, terms of reference and the membership and it would have to go up to City Council and be approved before the subcommittee could start meeting. Um, some consideration might be given as to whether um, the topics the working group was considering may be able to be considered by the full committee. Um, subcommittees or working groups are usually created um, historically when extra or more detailed consideration is required on items but there's always the option for the full committee to consider those items. But yes, bottom line, subcommittees can be created. Okay. Thank you, anyone else? No, okay. Um, with that, thank you very much for the presentation. Can I have someone move to receive the inf uh, presentation for information? Uh, Liv, thank you very much. All those in favor, any opposed, that carries, thank you. Um, our next item is the election of the vice chairs. Um, we will be looking for at least two vice chairs uh, to provide some supports to myself in case I need to leave the chair or in case I'm not able to convene the meeting. Um, so at this point in time, I'll be calling for nominations uh, from the committee. Uh, are there any nominations uh, for vice chair? Okay, uh, I will recognize Michelle first, go ahead. I nominate Stephanie. Okay. And Stephanie, uh, do you accept the nomination? Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Are there any other nominations for vice chair? Wendy? I'd like to nominate Glenn Hart. Okay. Thank you, and Glenn, do you accept the nomination? Yes, I do. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Michael, I see your hand also went up. No, Wendy beat you to it. <laughs> okay, uh, are there any other um, uh, nominations from the floor. Okay. 
So um, we have two nominations before us, and I'm going to be calling for nominations again. Are there any other members who would like to uh, pr uh, put forth a nomination for vice chair? Are there any further nominations for vice chair? No? Okay, so uh, again, we have um, Wendy who's nominated Stephanie as, sorry, um, Glenn Hart as well as uh, uh, Michelle who has nominated Stephanie. Um, these are our two nominees on the floor right now for vice chair. I'm calling for nominations for the third and final time. I see none. Um, therefore, I declare the nominations are now closed. Congratulations, Glenn and Stephanie. You are our two vice chairs for this term uh, of TAC. Thank you. Okay, if all elections could be so simple, uninterrupted, we didn't catch them. So um, just moving along, thank you very much, folks, for that. Uh, we're back now on item number DI 1.4, the accessibility feedback for vehicle for higher accessibility strategy. I'm going to invite our staff to the front of the room as they get ready to put together presentations for us. Um, there are, if there are members of the public who are interested in speaking to this item, please let us know. Um, if none, I think we're going to go right into, after the presentation, we'll head right into uh, questions. And just by way of reminder for the committee members, if you um, have questions, uh, there will be an opportunity for you to ask those questions after the presentation of staff. The questions which should be to clarify or, or um, uh, get additional information from the presentation. If I can ask you to group your questions all in one lump sum, uh, so therefore we get technology once and then move on. And the reason being is that I am also mindful that uh, we have a bit of a hard stop at 12.30. Okay. All right. Anybody looking for water at this point in time? You're all good? Fantastic. Okay, I'll start your clock. Go ahead. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I'll quickly go over um, the uh, four items we'd like to discuss today. Um, so on the next slide, the overview of the review, the background and general information, the accessibility strategies, the approaches that were being considered and um, um, specifically why we're here, and the proportion of wheelchair accessible taxi cabs in Toronto. Um, a quick primer on some of the acronyms that are used. Everybody's guilty of it. Um, MLS stands for the division that we work in, Municipal Licensing and Standards. PTC refers to the private transportation company. We know them best as Lyft and Uber. TTC, the Toronto Ta Transit Commission. Um, TTL, the Toronto Taxi Cab License. These are the wheelchair accessible taxi cabs that are licensed by the city. And lastly, WAVE, W-A-V, and that is the wheelchair accessible vehicles. Moving on, the purpose of the review, uh, we actually brought forward a bylaw in July 2016, which established a set of rules and regulations for taxi cabs, limousines, and the then new private transportation companies. Uh, subsequent to that, Council has asked us to review and report on how to proceed with an accessibility strategy, to uh, bring forward results of a congestion management study and an economic impact study, as Councillor uh, Wong Tam has previously mentioned, and then lastly, address any new and end or outstanding issues, such as training, mandatory equipment, and other considerations that are related to both public safety and the licensing. Uh, in the next slide, we see where we are in our timeline, and I'll just briefly mention that uh, we're now in phase three, having done two rounds of consultation and begun the studies. Uh, the last phase is expected to happen in June when we bring the report forward. The accessibility context and directives is Council has endorsed the goal of achieving an inclusive and accessible vehicle for hire industry that will ensure that all of our residents and visitors have equal access. Committee and Council have also directed staff to report on options to advance this accessibility in the industry, and that includes considering the creation of an accessibility fund, promoting side entry accessible taxicabs, and lastly, creating a working group 
to advance accessible vehicle for hire service. Um, I don't necessarily need to remind you, but I will do so, of our AODA requirements under the Act of 2005, and they are a requirement that the city consult with this TAC to determine the proportion of on-demand accessible taxi cabs that are required, identify progress made toward meeting the need for on-demand accessible taxi cabs, and ensure that owners and drivers are prohibited from charging a higher fee for people with disabilities, that they are prohibited also from charging a fee for the storage of assisted devices, and of course, adhere to all other accessibility requirements. Uh, a quick uh, review of the, the numbers. We have in Toronto 682 wheelchair accessible cabs, and that breaks down to 579 TTLs, as I mentioned earlier, and each of these must be associated with a licensed brokerage, and then a further 103 standard plates that are wheelchair accessible. This means that 13% of our licensed taxi cabs are wheelchair accessible. In terms of PTCs, these are companies, any company that has more than 500 drivers is responsible for providing WAVE service, wheelchair accessible vehicles. This service must be available when requested within the average wait time for non-accessible taxi service, and we have defined that as 11 minutes. And the fare cannot be higher than the fare that would be charged for the lowest cost, non-accessible ride. In Toronto, accessible trips, um, we compiled 2018 data from both the TTC, the brokerages, and the PTCs to better understand the volume of accessible trips in Toronto. For on-demand wave service, staff, and, and I should acknowledge uh, Dylan Feist, who has done all of this legwork, contacted five large brokerages for data, and these represent approximately 75% of our TTLs. Combined, these brokerages serviced approximately 500,000 WAVE taxicab trips in 2018 and 760,000 sedan-specific requests. I will put a caveat on that number um, as in, in two ways. The majority of the wave trips were done by a brokerage that uses only wheelchair accessible taxi cabs. And so we presume that not all of their trips would actually be for people requiring accessible service. Further, these values should only be considered an estimate due to the challenges of collecting and more importantly, verifying the data that we receive from the brokerages. In terms of public consultations, this talks to the uh, varying phases of our work. In the fall, staff hosted nine public consultation meetings on the proposed bylaw. We hear, heard concerns specifically about the higher cost of providing accessible services, that sedan taxi cabs are more accessible for some individuals, and that metered, on-demand, wheelchair accessible service is not always available as required. Suggestions heard included considering a dedicated accessibility fund to subsidize the cost and the maintenance of these accessible vehicles for hire and updating training requirements for the drivers. This spring, specifically last month, staff hosted a second round of public consultations and we are now in the process of compiling all that feedback and that will be included in the report that we bring forward in June. We have also a very focused uh, vehicle for hire accessibility panel. And this is comprised of users of the service, advocates, experts, and providers of the actual service. Staff consulted on a number of potential approaches with the panel and received the following feedback. And I'll just give you the highlights. Data collection. We believe that the city, they, uh, we heard loudly that the city should be collecting more data to assess wait times, service delivery, and specifically the demand for service. That there should be an accessibility fund. We heard quite uh, strong support for this, but also the need for accountability attached to that. Service standards. 
we heard that an accessible fund should consider tying funding to these standards to encourage vehicles to be on the road for a longer number of hours. And then lastly, driver training. We heard that uh, we should consider accessible training content, the method of delivery, and opportunities to centralize training. In terms of the vehicle for hire accessibility strategy, we are looking to promote equal access to this industry for all residents and visitors. We want to enhance the delivery of high quality accessible vehicle for hire service in Toronto, and of course, to build the capacity for the city to monitor this service and then ensure that we are responding to any unmet accessibility needs. Our considerations are as follows creating an accessibility fund to be dispersed to owners and drivers of wheelchair accessible taxi cabs based on service standards. Updating training requirements to ensure consistent and relevant training. And then monitoring the delivery of accessible vehicle for hire service, evaluating effectiveness of the fund, the accessibility fund, and lastly, identifying any unmet accessibility needs. We are focused on encouraging through in financial incentives, accessible cabs to be on the road delivering service. Um, and that we want to ensure that this at this point in time does not include the issuance of more accessible taxi cab licenses. We plan to collect data from the industry to better assess rather demand and monitor accessible service delivery. And if more TTLs um, accessible vehicle uh, plate or licenses rather are required staff would first come back and consult with this committee as is required and report to council with our recommendations that is the end of my presentation I want to just um, perhaps there is a does the presentation include the appendices uh, for any um, uh, of the members who are interested, uh, we do have a number of, of websites and I wanna draw your attention to the Vehicle for Hire Review General, um, General Information website, which is on the second page. And it's there that there is the survey for users of accessible services, which closes at the end of this month. And I would certainly encourage you to distribute it amongst your community. Um, we are looking to um, add that information to our um, focus groups, our jurisdictional scan, the feedback from the panel, and also the public. So thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Fiona. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions? Actually, or actually, before I call for questions of committee members, I should be asking members of the public, are there any members of the public who are here to speak? Okay, seeing none, we'll just bring it right here. Uh, and Michael, your hand went up first. Questions of, of staff. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, number one, there have been many complaints by some of the wheelchair accessible drivers that their insurance costs are much higher than reg regular taxi cabs. Would the accessibility fund address those higher insurance costs? And second question is, were any of the wheelchair accessible drivers uh, included as part of the consultations? Two great questions. So first for the insurance, um, that was identified through the consultations, especially the ones with the drivers of the TTL vehicles, that insurance is uh, higher for them. Um, something else we noticed is that insurance to add a second driver is actually cost prohibitive for a lot of drivers. So through the accessibility fund, what we're looking to, um, to assess is really that cost difference between providing service through a standard taxi cab, so a sedan taxi cab, and then through the wheelchair accessible taxi cab. So we know these have higher costs, especially for conversion, to convert the vehicle so that it is actually wheelchair accessible. And then delivering the service um, is a lot more expensive in many ways, um, including fuel um, and, as you mentioned, insurance. So we are looking at all these different ways that the cost is higher so that in the accessibility fund, we can hopefully offset that to promote these 600 or so wheelchair accessible vehicles to be on the road delivering service. Sorry, and then to answer your second question, um, if drivers were invited to these. Drivers were invited to them. Um, unfortunately, both uh, um, ones that we had identified declined, um, but they were well represented in the public consultations. So our public uh, consultation with the drivers and the owners had about 60 individuals attend last month. Okay, thank you. Okay. 
Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Our next question is coming from Liv and then Wendy. Go thank ahead. you uh, for all the effort that went into doing all these consultations, the data collection and the preparation of the presentation. Um, a, a clarification <clears throat> question. When you refer to um, service standards, um, it, you note a couple of times that there is a recommendation that, service, uh, that the fund be tied to service standards and that that be around increasing the number of vehicles on the road. I'm wondering if those service standards are just about wait times and numbers of vehicles on the road or if there is a customer service element included in, in the visioning of those service standards. That's a really good question. So what we've done is we've looked at other jurisdictions who've done this. Um, and they have kind of done a combination approach. So service standards that we're looking at right now, um, certainly nothing's finalized, um, includes number of hours on the road, because we know that these vehicles, they are dual purpose, so not all of the trips that they take are wheelchair accessible. And we heard through the consultations that it's actually only about five to 15% that they do are wheelchair accessible. Um, so to your point, yeah, the service standards would look more at number of hours on the road to encourage these vehicles to actually be on the road available to provide service so that when a brokerage does dispatch them, they are, the brokerage has vehicles available. Um, to your other point about customer service standards, um, jurisdictions have looked at especially number of complaints and especially number of validated complaints about both the condition of the vehicle as well as the, um, the driver's um, adherence to our bylaws, um, including um, being civil and well-behaved. Um, so that is something that we're considering as well to make sure that that quality of service is there, um, as well as through, as Fiona mentioned, updating and looking at training requirements to make sure that they're meeting um, what um, Torontonians expect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liv. Uh, next question is coming from Wendy and then Stephanie. And I'll put them all together this time. Thank you. Okay, so uh, a follow-on question around training. How would you monitor uh, increased training amongst drivers? So that's question one for me. Question two is why has the issuance of more accessible taxi cab licenses been ruled out as an option at this point? Um, so first to training. So um, right now, in order to actually um, be a driver on these wheelchair accessible vehicles, either a standard plate or a TTL, you require an accessibility endorsement on your license. So you can only get that if you have gone through one of our approved training programs. So we have three organizations that offer that program. Um, and those have been vetted through our division as meeting the uh, requirements that we have um, for training. Um, through this, we're looking at, um, I should also say, they are required to take a refresher course every four years. Um, so through this process, we're, look, we're going to look back and see the criteria that we have for that curriculum and make sure that that is meeting what we've heard in the consultations as uh, being required. And then we're also going to look at how often a refresher course is required. Um, we heard through the consultations and through the accessibility panel that there might be um, value in having this course more often. Um, delivering the service requires a technical knowledge um, that drivers of sedan, taxi cabs don't necessarily need to have. And we want to make sure that they're, they're knowledgeable enough and that they are properly securing the mobility device and assisting the person into and out of the vehicle properly and most importantly, safety, safely. Um, in terms of issuance of more wheelchair accessible licenses, um, that kind of comes down to the higher cost of owning and operating these vehicles. And through the consultations, we've heard quite loudly from the industry um, that adding more licenses won't necessarily increase the number of vehicles on the road, especially as they get older um, and they meet the seven year maximum age. Um, the, yeah, so, oh yeah, data is a good point. But in terms of issuance, the li issuing the licenses, um, Drivers and owners are, are not putting their vehicles on the road for the full length of time for a number of reasons. And one of the things that we heard was that higher cost of owning the vehicles and then operating them. So maintenance costs are much higher, but then delivering the service itself, um, oftentimes there's a longer length of time to get to the individual. Um, and during that time, obviously the individuals or the driver's not being paid for that. And then once they get to the individual, more time assisting the person and securing their mobility device at both the um, beginning and the end of the trip. And in our bylaw, they're prohibited from charging a fee for that, and rightfully so, because the fee has to be the same as sedan. So for that reason, uh, what we heard through the consultations is that instead of adding more supply to this, what we need to do is encourage the supply that we currently have to be on the road delivering service. And that might include um, like reducing that cost for, um, sorry, for the cost differential between the standard plate and the wheelchair accessible. 
Um, and as Fiona just reminded me, data is a big thing that we're lacking through this. So currently we, we are unable to assess with accuracy that, that wait time. Um, as well as the demand for the service. So a huge component of this involves um, going up to the brokerages and putting in the bylaw um, some updated data requirements so that we're able to collect more information on how often wheelchair accessible vehicles are requested, how often individuals have to wait for this. And then once we have that data and we're able to assess it, we'll be in a much better position to understand if we need to issue more of these licenses um, or if, for example, hopefully that accessibility fund is working properly. Thank you, any other question from Wendy? No? Um, questions from Stephanie. Thank you uh, very much. I have three questions. I'm just gonna ask one and then. Yeah, you can ask, response. he can answer, just keep it within five minutes. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, you were talking about data and one of the things uh, that I wanted to know when you were talking about the tying it to rating relating to customer service. Do you have currently any um, ideas of how we could improve uh, evaluating the customer service uh, for people who use these vehicles outside of uh, an individual complaint? What is the mechanism? That's great. So one of the things, like I mentioned, is looking at complaints. But then another thing is understanding how we can better, um, how the service can be better delivered. Uh, so a big way that we're looking through that is through this survey that we have online. Last I checked, over 100 individuals who use wheelchair accessible service have completed this survey. And in that survey, we have uh, two similar but slightly more nuanced questions of how we can improve accessible service and how we can ensure that a high level of customer service is there. So we're going to be taking that feedback very seriously so we can look at making improvements uh, for that. Uh, one of the things, uh, my second question, you had mentioned that the number of trips uh, that were allocated for uh, wheelchair access, and you said that you gave a corollary relating to it did come up from a company that was only providing wheelchair accessible uh, vehicles. Um, and I'm just wondering if your assumption that they were also um, dealing with non-wheelchair accessible vehicles, was that uh, potentially confirmed by the company or is it an assumption that you, um, how did that come about? Right, great question. So when we were working with this particular um, brokerage to, to get the numbers, they were reluctant to share the data because they didn't want that number to correspond directly to um, trips where the individual required the wheelchair accessible service. Um, but with that being said, they're unable to quantify how many of them were for because they don't capture that information because of the nature of their business. They don't, they don't have a requirement to ask or they don't need to for the business because it's all accessible. Understood, thank you. And the third question, um, it, was the accessibility fund also anticipated to be used for uh, extra training for customer service or for drivers? Um, I wouldn't say extra training, but we are looking at reimbursing the cost of training for these drivers because it is a requirement um, that drivers of wheelchair accessible vehicles need, whereas drivers of uh, sedan taxis don't require. So that is an extra cost for them. So that's been something that has been, been identified as something to look at in terms of offsetting the cost. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Are there any other questions from committee members? No, seeing none. I just have a couple of quick questions myself. Uh, with respect to trying to square the uh, um, I guess uh, the, the recognition of City Council wanting to achieve the goal of, of inclusive and accessible vehicle for hire industry. That means every vehicle across the platform, whether it's limos, Ubers, Lyfts, taxis, um, and wanting to make sure that they're ex fully accessible for all the residents, however they need to, to hail the, the, the service. And then the uh, following up on Wendy's question is the, the capping or the limiting of additional licenses that are specifically um, accessible uh, caps. How do we square that? Yes, so data is one of the big things that we need to be able to better understand the demand for this service. And what we did when we compiled the data, so we looked at TTC data, brokerage data, and then PTC, so Lyft and Uber data for this. Um, and something that was a bit surprising for myself is that a lot of individuals actually request sedan-specific taxi cabs um, because that is what's most accessible to them. So we hear particularly individuals who are elderly or individuals who have smaller mobility devices that might be collapsible or canes, they find getting into and out of a sedan is much easier. Um, and that data is, or, or that is backed up through the data. So for example, um, the TTC 
um, serviced um, about 1.3 million sedan specific trips last year. Although the TTC wheel trans program is different than this on demand accessible, um, it does indicate that there is a demand there. And then brokerages, while certainly not all of them capture those specific requests, of the brokerages that do, we're aware of, it looks like about um, 750,000 sedan specific requests from brokerages um, because that's what the individual had required. We can't validate that this was for an accessibility reason, but it would have been for some specific reason that they asked for a sedan only. So you have the data for, for that particular uh, audience and the, the, t the preference of vehicles that they have, but you don't seem to have the data for uh, folks who are requiring accessible cabs and do you, and so the intention is to capture more data, but also are you going to be measuring that along the line of also ex, um, uh, the quality of service, the frequency of service, uh, the satisfaction of, of user experience? Like how, how do you evaluate, how do you weigh that against each other and still ensure that the vehicle for hire sector is inclusive and accessible for all? Oh. D data again, I think the most Im one of the most important things we need to look at is wait time for a vehicle. We hear that wait times for an accessible vehicle are exponentially or significantly longer than wait times for a non-accessible vehicle. Um, and that is a big factor and that means it's not accessible for all. So uh, once we're able to collect a better idea of how long it takes to get a sedan taxi cab and then also through this we'll be able to get data on how long individuals are waiting for a wheelchair accessible vehicle, we'll be able to better understand if there's a um, if, if we're, we're meeting our target or moving towards meeting that target because it really, that's, that's a key factor in, in determining whether or not it's equitable. So wouldn't uh, satisfaction levels rise for users, uh, uh, the, the hires, the, the, those who are requiring the service, um, as well as the wait times go down if you had more accessible caps? And if in order for you to have more accessible vehicles, you're going to need to increase the number of licenses out there. Which is yes. going in the opposite direction of your recommendations. Potentially, yes. The challenge, though, is the business side of it is actually operating these vehicles. And for the individuals, um, they're owner-operated typically. Typically, the owner is also the driver for this. Um, they invest a lot of money in yep. the vehicles. Um, we hear through the TTL owners that, I mean, even just purchasing the vehicle, a sedan versus a van, there's going to be a cost difference already. To convert the van, it's about $18,000 for a rear entry conversion and about $27,000 for a side entry conversion. Um, slightly higher um, insurance, as we've talked about. Also, maintenance costs are higher once you um, retrofit a vehicle or you do that, that, that type of work on a vehicle, we hear that after towards the seven year lifespan of the vehicle, it does get more expensive. Um, and then actually delivering the service. I went through the factors that make, make the service delivery actually more expensive, including um, higher fuel consumption rates. So um, it's one thing to put the vehicles on the road, but it's another thing to actually have um, these, these licenses be out there and these taxi cabs being out there and being used to their full potential. Um, otherwise, we're just adding additional supply um, and not maximizing the current supply that we have. Um, so through this, getting the data and then being able to really assess whether or not the supply is meeting the demand. Um, if we do all this and we see that, that it's not meeting the demand, absolutely we can come back and look at issuing more licenses. My final question is the accessibility fund. Is the, access, is the accessibility fund intended for the drivers who are driving these um, money losing accessible vehicles so that they, for, can, they can continue to operate but with a subsidy? Yes, but also for the owners. So although they are a lot of them owner operated, but looking at um, kind of two different um, components of the accessibility fund is what we're looking at. Again, nothing is finalized, but um, for owners, there is that cost for maintenance and for convert, converting the vehicle initially. So being able to actually incentivize these licensees, uh, many of the licenses are going to be reaching that seven year mark shortly and incentivizing the owners to be replacing those vehicles and putting um, new, wheelchair accessible taxi cabs on them, but then also for the drivers to incentivize the drivers to be on the road. Um, and that might also help to, as um, owners no longer drive the vehicle, um, having some sort of incentive to have new drivers come in and deliver this service who are um, through this well-trained, able to deliver the service competently, and then also are incentivized because there's not a significantly higher cost to deliver this service versus going and driving a sedan taxi cab. Great, thank you very much. Um, any other questions, Glenn? Hi, um, my question is training specific as to the current standards and what's anticipated. 
Does the current training or what you anticipate include diversity and inclusion training? And I ask that for a very specific reason. It's one thing to be competent in the mechanics of efficiently putting a wheelchair into a vehicle, but there, in the experience of many clients and people whom I know, the attitudinal problem is as great as the technical one. Absolutely. So the current curriculum that we have that we would assess a, um, a potential um, organization who wants to provide this training does include it. So it includes three parts. The first part is that diversity sensitivity training um, uh, and making sure individuals understand that there are people with a variety of different needs and different abilities out there and that they need to respond to them. Um, there's also the legal requirement so that they know items related to fair refusal around service animals and what AODA requires and what our bylaw requires for them. Um, and then third, there's that physical component that you talked about is actually having the technical knowledge to be able to perform the work. Um, through our consultations and the accessibility panel, uh, we identified that there is still a lack of knowledge in the, um, uh, in the industry, specifically around service animals. Um, we've heard lots of stories how service animals continue to be refused or individuals with service animals also refuse the service. Um, and that's prohibited in the bylaw, but just because it's prohibited in the bylaw, it's still occurring and that just indicates that our accessibility strategy needs to ensure that that component is met. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, go ahead, Miranda. Um, I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit to more, more towards um, how accessing the fund, um, how you can um, measure um, and what mechanism, if you could give an example of a mechanism um, where you can monitor um, that it's evenly spread across the board in terms of vendors, right? So that the subsidy is not just given to one particular vendor all the time over another. That's, that's a great question. So um, I mentioned before um, a separation between the drivers and the owners. So for the owners, one thing that we're looking at is um, offsetting that conversion cost, but rather than offsetting it as a lump sum, having that spread over the seven model year of the vehicle so that the individual is encouraged to have that vehicle on the road delivering service rather than pay the money up front and risk having that vehicle not on the road the full length of time. And then for the drivers, um, I guess owners and drivers were looking at an incentive program uh, tied to service delivery. So the idea that if a driver is out there delivering service in a full-time capacity uh, with minimum number of complaints, for example, that driver should be eligible for quite a bit more money than an individual who's driving part-time and not delivering the service well. Um, and we would structure the fund in such a way that um, not everybody is entitled to the same amount of money, but rather it's based on your performance and your delivery of service. Uh, particularly so that the city re receives a return on its investment in the money rather than just handing out money, hoping things go well. Okay. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Are there any speakers to the item? Okay, Wendy, go ahead. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I just wanted to say that it worries me a little bit that the the Consideration for the additional license issuance is not a real option at this point. Um, and it seems to me that a lot of the feedback about why you're not doing that comes from industry, right? So industry is kind of telling you that it costs us more money to be able to operate these taxis. Um, but what, we, what you're not considering and what's not factored in at this point is the perspective of people with disabilities who are you know, experiencing long wait times and poor service in terms of their access to taxis. The folks who are operating these taxis also have a relatively captive audience, right? So you're talking about um, the perspective of them losing money when they're assisting passengers and getting into the vehicles and uh, finding people. Um, but at the same time, with you know such a limited number of taxis available that are accessible, there are also there's a captive audience. So there are also always going to be people who are looking for those taxis. Um, it's not clear to me at what point you are going to decide to uh, factor in the perspective of people with disabilities on the issue and think about whether or not, again, the issuance of additional taxi licenses might be something that could come to bear and improve this situation. Um, so just to say that those are the kinds of concerns I have. Uh, thank you very much, Wendy. Anyone else? No? Okay, I'll just speak very quick, um, briefly and quickly, hopefully. Um, this is, this is a very difficult file. 
I, I really feel that uh, based on the needs of those who are living with disabilities and who require supports, we should be able to make accommodations as a city to meet them where they are. And in order for us to do that, it means that we have to deliver the same level of service or better to meet the equitable uh, requirements um, in order for us to really be true to the objective of City Council that has set out about building a, a vehicle for higher uh, sector and industry that's going to be inclusive and accessible to all Ontarians as well as visitors. That's one hand. And the other hand, the challenge is, is that we have 67,000 Uber and Lyft drivers who are, who've changed the rules for the vehicle for hire industry in the city of Toronto. And by way of regulating them and permitting them to operate in the city, it just means that the taxi industry is now not as, not as strongly regulated as, we, as we'd like in order for us to push forward our objective of creating an accessible fleet of vehicles. Not necessarily the, the, the fault of staff. I know you're doing and carrying out the work of council, but the council has left us, I would say, in a bit of a mess because we're going to be restricting the number of licenses for accessible vehicles and at the same time, we're actually creating a system for two different types of users, which means that you're going to always have poor service. And, um, and I think that it's, it's just extremely unfortunate because I know that you're doing the very best that you can uh, to try to remedy a situation that is just really not working. It's not working for the drivers of these um, a sort of money losing vehicles and it's very difficult on them and the livelihood that they have to provide for, for their families. It's also very difficult for those who require the service who have no other option. Um, and, uh, and so there's two groups of individuals that I see are harmed by our policy uh, and all of it is because we actually made a mistake at the very beginning by deregulating and, and relaxing those rules to start off with. Um, I don't know what the fix will be, but we have to, um, I would think, at some point in time, recalibrate our priorities. And it can't be, um, you know, letting Uber and Lyft dictate the type of service and the quality of service that they believe is good because it's easier for them to deliver as opposed to what we want as a city. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. I know that. Uh, you uh, still have an additional amount of work before you. I know that this, as some of those discussions are extremely um, charged uh, at those consultations, and I am also very sympathetic uh, to the drivers of, uh, of those accessibility um, vehicles because they're financially hurting and they're trying to just literally keep their head afloat. And at the same time, we're not really delivering, as I, I see it, um, the very best outcome and service for those who really require the service. They have no other option. This is it. Um, thank you. Um, can I please have a motion to receive the report? Uh, Wendy, all those in favor? A any opposed? That carries. Thank you. Um, let's get ready for our next presentation, which is coming from DI 1.5, Accessibility Review of On-Street Bikeway Design Guidelines. I recognize that we also have a speaker, uh, Gordon Brown, who's here. Let's hear first from the presentation. I know you have 33 slides and a lot of heavy technical information. Um, I'm just gonna ask Jennifer if you can verify how much time do you need? Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. Sorry, thanks. We have two questions at the end that we pose to the committee, but if the committee has other questions, then we can just okay. work that way. Super, yeah. thank you. Yeah. So we'll hear from the staff uh, who will deliver the presentation. Then we're going to hear from our, pub our uh, member uh, from the public who's speaking to the item. Uh, then we'll bring it into um, our committee for questions of staff. Okay. When you're ready. All right. Thank you very much and uh, thank you to all the committee members for taking the time for this meeting and this item. My name is Jason and I'm uh, with the consulting firm WSP and one of the lead authors of the Cycling Design Guide. Today I'm going to uh, speak about the guide to give you uh, an overview of its contents, how it was developed and what our next steps are. In this overview, I'll focus on the areas related to accessibility and, of course, happy to take questions at the end of the presentation. 
The guide has been developed first and foremost for the broad range of practitioners that help to plan, design, and implement cycling facilities. Uh, we know that there are also many stakeholders who may not be directly involved in this uh, process, but want to understand or in some cases contribute to the process, so the guide will be made available publicly once it has been finalized. We have been developing the guide since 2016 and have engaged a technical advisory committee on three occasions. Our technical advisory committee, or our, our technical advisory committee included staff uh, from the Accessibility Office and we've also engaged external stakeholders uh, including the TTC's uh, Accessibility Committee as well. From our stakeholder engagement, we received a number of comments related to accessibility. Uh, and uh, while I don't have uh, time to go through all of them, a few of the ones that, uh, that stood out. Uh, first, we have a section that talks about the design cyclist, and this is referring to who planners and engineers are uh, thinking about and anticipating as they do their work. And uh, one of the comments was that we should certainly include a, uh, a cyclist with a physical disability who might be using a non-standard bicycle uh, in that list. And, uh, and so we have uh, made that change since receiving that comment. And the other, a, a number of comments that we received related to the general overarching theme of making sure that cycling facilities don't uh, in any way prevent pedestrians with visual impairments from navigating sidewalks, uh, transit stops, pick up and drop off areas, uh, and intersections. So th those are some introductory comments and the rest of the presentation uh, focuses on going through the, the contents of the guide chapter by chapter. The first chapter is a very brief one and it outlines uh, the, the content of the guide and also provides a bit of uh, context, uh, which we've already covered in the, in the preceding slides for the most part. It's uh, to provide a high-level overview of how the chapters fit together. Uh, chapter two is all about uh, principles for facility design. Uh, it tries to answer the question, what should planners and engineers uh, be thinking about uh, before they start going through the, the design process? Chapters three and four focus on design details for mid-block and intersection locations respectively. Chapter five is about the design and operation of bicycle signals. And chapter six outlines the overall planning and design process. So moving on to chapter two. Uh, there are four sections uh, in this chapter and I'll go through some of the highlights from these sections now. So we have five key principles uh, for designing cycling facilities that we describe in the guide. And these principles include prioritizing safety, uh, which we uh, sort of have a, a very wide definition of to encompass all road users, uh, making cycling a comfortable experience, building complete streets, and considering operations and city services, and finally, using funding efficiently. Uh, we also talk about uh, the design domain in this chapter. Uh, this is uh, a bigger, bigger subject um, that we won't get into fully here, but uh, one of the key points is that we want to provide very clear guidance about when it is and when it is not appropriate to use minimum dimensions for, uh, for facilities because that's a topic that um, we have received a lot of, uh, lot of input and feedback about. Uh, another topic in this chapter, which I alluded to briefly earlier, is the design cyclist. Again, this is uh, who planners and engineers are thinking about when they're designing these facilities. And one of the themes of the guide is that we want to create cycling facilities that are appropriate for all ages and abilities. And so that's why this, this section sort of has a very prominent place in the guide and we spent uh, a fair bit of time developing it. Uh, and the, the goal really uh, is to have as many people using these facilities 
uh, as possible. Uh, so we, in this section, have provided a list of different types of cyclists that planners and engineers should be thinking about, and as I mentioned at the beginning, based on some of the input we received, uh, a cyclist with a physical uh, disability using a non-standard cyclist has been added uh, to that list. Moving on to chapter three, which is titled Facility Design. Uh, the, uh, the chapter is broken down into four parts. The first part is about cycle tracks, which are defined as any cycling facility that has some form of separation, some form of physical separation between uh, motorists and cyclists. Uh, bike lanes, which provide designated space for cyclists on the roadway but don't have any form of physical separation. Shared streets, where cyclists generally uh, share space with, uh, with motorists. And finally, a, a short section on cycling friendly streets that don't have any specific cycling facilities, but general considerations that should apply to all streets in the city's network. So the first section is about uh, cycle tracks. And uh, this is, uh, cycle tracks will be an important part of the city's cycling network. Uh, we know that as you provide more separation between motorists and cyclists, that uh, it is also important to think about how we are separating pedestrians uh, from cyclists. As we shift cyclists sort of further away from traffic, that uh, implies that they are sort of moving potentially closer uh, into the boulevard. And so we have a, uh, a section that focuses specifically on uh, pedestrian and cyclist separation uh, in this section. And some of the techniques that we talk about for separating pedestrians and cyclists include uh, uh, various types of curbs, including barrier curbs and beveled curbs to provide uh, an elevation change between the cycling facility and the sidewalk. Uh, also having cane detectable unit pavers, uh, planting strips, and in some cases, uh, even railings. Uh, we also have a separate section that speaks specifically to curbside activity. Uh, and a big part of this is where we have designated pickup and drop off uh, locations. Uh, we have at these locations, we have marked crosswalks across the cycle track, and we have pavement markings and signs that indicate that cyclists must yield to pedestrians. We also recommend a one meter buffer uh, between the edge of the roadway uh, or lay-by, as the case may be, and the cycle track so that pedestrians aren't boarding or alighting a vehicle from directly within the cycle track. Uh, the second section in the guide focuses on bike lanes and uh, in this case, the, uh, the curbside activity is, is quite different from cycle tracks in that a wheel trans vehicle or a taxi is uh, permitted to enter into the bike lane to uh, undertake a, a pickup or a drop off. And in these locations, a cyclist would, uh, would overtake uh, the, uh, the taxi or the wheel trans vehicle by merging into the motor vehicle lane and passing on the left side, uh, not uh, not crossing the path of a uh, pedestrian. Moving on to chapter four, this chapter focuses on intersections, uh, also focuses on barriers and transitions, and is, is probably the most dense technical chapter uh, in the guide. So just going to focus on a couple of highlights from this chapter. Uh, one of the fundamental questions for intersection design with cycling facilities is where should the cycling facility be aligned uh, through the intersection? Should it cross the intersection immediately adjacent to the motor vehicle lane, or should the bicycle crossing be pushed further uh, from the intersection to cross a setback location? We spent a lot of time looking at this question in the guide, and from a safety perspective, we think that there are some advantages and some disadvantages to both of these approaches. So we have included both designs in the guide, and the guide does not actually state that one is, uh, is preferred or better than uh, the other. It's, um, 
Here you can see uh, an example of what the setback crossing looks like, and I'll just jump to the previous slide just to contrast that with a bicycle crossing that's adjacent to the motor vehicle lane. And uh, we, we acknowledge that by having a, uh, a cyclist crossing that is set further back from the intersection that this implies that the pedestrian crossing will also be set further back. And in this, uh, in this section, we identify several strategies uh, to try and, uh, and make this a smooth transition for pedestrians, including the, uh, the angle of alignment uh, for the pedestrian clearway, uh, as well as having continuous uh, zebra stripes, the, the pedestrian crossing markings that go from sidewalk to sidewalk, and also positioning the accessible pedestrian signal uh, at, the, uh, at the sidewalk and not uh, in one of, uh, one of the islands between the cycle track and the roadway. Uh, we do also talk about uh, in boulevard cycling facilities. These are typically in a more suburban context and uh, wherever we have separated facilities for pedestrians and cyclists mid-block, the guide indicates that these users should also be separated uh, on the corners and through the crossings of the intersection. Next, I want to touch briefly on transit stops. And we have a pretty extensive uh, section on transit stops uh, with a, a range of different options. The images here show different uh, examples, and they include uh, a stop with a dedicated transit platform island and the cycling facility uh, being aligned between the platform and the, uh, and the boulevard. Uh, stops where the cycle track is integrated into the platform itself, which is similar to the design that we have on Sherborne Street uh, and a number of other streets in the city, uh, as well as uh, examples where the cycling facility is on the street uh, and different examples for streetcar stops as well. Moving on to chapter five, this section is about bicycle signals, and we talk about uh, some regulatory and planning aspects, operations, uh, the actual bicycle signal heads themselves, uh, detection and actuation, so how uh, cyclists are picked up at, uh, at a signal, and uh, have a section on special applications, most of which is focused on uh, what are referred to as offset intersections. One of the things to highlight here from an accessibility perspective is that we have a strong emphasis on trying to provide uh, protected signal phasing uh, at as many locations as possible. And what, uh, what this refers to is where uh, cyclist movements are separated in time from conflicting uh, motor vehicle movements. So where right-turning motorists, for example, uh, are separated in time from the cyclists who are crossing adjacent to them. And this obviously uh, offers a lot of benefits from a cycling safety perspective, but it's worth noting that this is also a considerable benefit for uh, pedestrian safety as well. Uh, since pedestrians uh, would be separated from the conflicting motor vehicle movements. Finally, the last chapter is about process. And in this chapter, we uh, talk about different, different types of projects and the context for them, as well as uh, the planning, design, implementation, and evaluation aspects of, uh, of the process. Uh, this chart shows the overarching uh, process from conception to post-evaluation, and it's worth noting in the red box there is where we have stake or consultation, and this typically happens uh, when the facility type is being confirmed and during the uh, early stages of design. The input that's received from the consultation process, of course, informs uh, the full design process. Uh, finally, we have a list of key stakeholders uh, in the process, and the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee is listed here in this table. And so that brings me to the conclusion of the contents of the guide, and we wanted to uh, pose three questions to uh, the members of the committee, and those are, first, what are the greatest challenges with cycling facilities today that committee members are aware of? Second question, 
What are some of the most effective design treatments that have been used to mitigate these concerns elsewhere? And third question, how do members of the accessibility community use on-street cycling facilities, uh, example using a tricycle or hand bikes, and what infrastructure challenges do they face? Great. Thank you very much for that very full presentation. There's lots to digest. Um, at this point in time, we're going to be hearing from members of the public, uh, which means I'm going to be asking staff, to, are there members of the public who are here to speak? Gord, you're still speaking? Okay, great. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, perhaps ask staff to uh, take a seat on the side, and I'm going to be inviting Gord Brown to come and address the committee. Okay, thank you. But don't go too far. We're going to, be, we're going to bring you back. Okay. Gord, welcome. Thank you. Uh, if, sure. Yeah, Andy's going to give you a hand. Just have to turn it the other way. And I'll start your clock. Okay, good morning. Um, I'm speaking as a private citizen, a professional engineer who, by virtue of friends and family with a variety of disabilities, cares a lot about the details of what keeps pedestrians safe. I appreciate the opportunity to speak today on pedestrian safety considerations, and I have had the privilege of speaking to this committee twice in the past. My views on pedestrian simple are very simple and reflect what has served as well. I believe pedestrians of all abilities are safest and most comfortable when they have a few simple safeguards to keep them passively safe, separated from faster moving things. A cane detectable grade separation with a curb to warn pedestrians that they are about to step into harm's way and to discourage cyclists from joining us on the sidewalk. A standard internationally recognized zebra crossing to guide pedestrians from curb to curb, sidewalk to sidewalk, across all traffic, including cyclists. And finally, clear, unambiguous street design, signage, signals, pavement markings, whatever it takes to make clear how we should be safely navigating the roadway, especially for those with disabilities. When cycling infrastructure was being introduced around the city some years back, I noticed these simple protections were being either removed or modified. Uh, and when they were modified, it was with the status goal of reducing car bike interactions in cycle track designs. I presented examples that concerned me to this committee in September 2015. And uh, these included at Queen's Key, installation of a fast moving cycle sidewalk level, the Martin Goodman Trail between the pedestrian area and Queen's Key Transit with ineffective separation. Again on Queen's Key, crosswalks and lights were taken away and you're left with a bike sign that says, be careful crossing here and a number of watch and, and yield signs and a variety of other things that have happened including a mixing area at Queen's Park. The committee members shared my concern, passed a motion asking staff to address these concerns in the cycle track review, and in October 2015, the committee passed a similar motion that pedestrian cycle track safety concerns be addressed in the upcoming Complete Streets Guidelines, where I was a stakeholder. The good news is that with extensive input from pedestrian and accessibility advocates, Complete Streets Guidelines did provide extensive direction on roadway design for pedestrian safety. These included requirements for a pedestrian clearway that is safely and, and, and appropriately separated from cycling infrastructure along its length and at crossings, and a clear statement that cyclist-pedestrian mixing areas are to be avoided. The bad news is a longer list in that the cycle track guidelines fails to acknowledge Complete Streets Guidelines as a governing document, and it appears that many of the problems that I identified in 2015 are now being allowed to continue, and I'd be happy to share examples with you during the question period. A particular concern is the option to specify sidewalk level cycle tracks and pedestrian cyclist mixing areas, which you see here in the slide that was originally part of the deck, but I don't recall seeing it on the screen. What this does is bring up a lot of questions. Under what specific conditions might mixing areas be appropriate? Things like a volume of cyclists and pedestrians, demographics using the area, is it different on a sidewalk than a multi-use trail and so on? When might they work? If you're using them, how do you make them safe? Under what specific con conditions might sidewalk level cycle tracks make sense? Once again, when are you gonna choose this option? How specifically are you gonna make it safe? These and many more questions can only be answered if we can get together as accessibility stakeholders and have a chance to go through this in de detail. 
Gil Penalosa of 880 City states the obvious when he says that if you mix pedestrians and cyclists, pedestrians will get injured. New York City records collisions of pedestrians and cyclists, Toronto doesn't, so we have no idea what it is, but we just know that if you mix them, it's gonna get higher. Vision Zero gets it right, requiring that infrastructure designs reduce the potential for road user conflict, and through clear, simplistic design principles, in my words, ensure that there remains a high level of inherent road safety even when road users make mistakes, especially when those users have disabilities. In closing, staff are to be congratulated on creating a very comprehensive, technically exhaustive 210 page cycling guideline. In fact, it's probably everything a cyclist could want. But I respectfully suggest that what needs to happen now is a thorough review of this massive document with Protection and Accessibility Act of Advocates, a process that would allow pedestrian safety and comfort issues that I, Walk Toronto, and others have identified during the limited stakeholdering process, but also allow latent safety issues to be identified and worked through with your input and the guidance from Complete Streets Guidelines. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Gord, for your deputation. Are there any questions of the, uh, the speaker? Uh, go ahead, Wendy. Thank you very much for your presentation, Gord. Thank you. Um, you said, I think, that there were things that you had raised previously uh, to this committee that are still a concern. And I wonder, you offered to provide some examples. Could you provide some? Yep, yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Um, let's start off with, with this one, which is, uh, if I'm not speaking loud enough, please let me know. Um, this is the, uh, I think Mason had mentioned that we ensure separation along the track and intersections. That's true for this situation on the left. What you see is what looks like a typical crosswalk and sidewalk. Lord, I'm just going to hold your time and interrupt you for a second. Oh, sorry, just reset your clock. But you had, you had 40 seconds. Um, it's helpful if you could speak into the microphone just because the proceedings of this committee are being broadcast through CCTV. Okay. Where's the microphone, over here? Uh, there is a microphone directly in front of Michelle. All right, I'll do my best. Okay. Or just try to project in there. No, no, I appreciate Thank you. All right. Um, so once again, separated space is what we've traditionally seen. You've got a crosswalk to get you from side to side, curb to curb, across all traffic. This is a way in which, by having the cycling facilities on the road, we preserve the, the safety factors that I talked about. It, it just is, is, thank you very much. Uh, it's clear and simple. What concerns me is a shared space shows up here. And as I was indicating, it's not clear to me, when does that make sense? Maybe in a suburban area with very, very low traffic volumes or wide open spaces, or maybe it's part of a, uh, a mixed, use mixed use trail where you're tending to self-select people who tend to be a bit more fit, a bit more able, and not have balance issues. But it concerns me to see this in here when Complete Street Guidelines says avoid mixing areas. So that's one thing I think it didn't fix. A second thing, uh, this is Queens Park at Hoskin. This is one of the mixing areas that I referred to. The cycle tracks, bi-directional here, unidirectional over here. To join them up, what happens is cyclists come along here, cut in front of pedestrians, exiting from the crosswalk, stepping out up onto the curb, and go in the way. So a pedestrian steps from the crosswalk to the curb and is walking into an unmarked bi-directional cycle track, which personally I find would be uncomfortable. At the presentation when they were redoing really Queen's Park, this was an option put forward by staff. Everything happens on the road, the pedestrians get the park, but because staff at the time thought that it was working okay, they didn't put it in. I think it should still be done. Another example, if I have time, is this one, which is Queen's Key West, and I was talking about what happens when you're crossing the street. You have a crosswalk to take you across all the traffic, the transit lanes, but as soon as you get to the far side, which is where the Martin Goodman Trail is, which is a speed limit of 20 kilometers an hour, all you're faced with is a bike symbol, right? There, there's no crosswalk, the traffic signals don't guide you across, you basically have to make it across on your own, in my opinion, with very little guidance. I don't see this being fixed or presented, prevented by the guidelines. Thirdly, uh, the gentleman spoke about separation. Uh, in fact, when you look at the, at the guide, the, the, the section on, on, on cyclist and 
car separation is extensive. It's an engineer's dream that talks about options, guidelines, pros and cons, when do you use it, recommendations. The pedestrian cyclist is a, is a page of pros that says you could do this, you could do that, if you do more of them it's better. I personally think we deserve better. With this one, you talk about separation. Once again, you've got 20 kilometers per hour, the highest, I believe it's the highest volume cycle track in the city, and they're moving fast. All you have separating from the pedestrian area is a rumble strip. If this gets crowded, where do the cyclists go? If someone is distracted, where do they go? It's an accident waiting to happen. So once again, the issue of how do you provide separation, I think needs the same kind of rigor that we have here, right? What are the options? When do you choose them? In my opinion, this should be a five foot wide treed area and then have crosswalks that take you over to the, over to the crossing area. Uh, finally, um, this is another one that didn't get fixed in my opinion, or that could be better. This is called an integrated transit stop. And what happens is, in this case, the, the sidewalks are, are, the bike tracks are already raised to sidewalk level for the entire section of Lower Sherburne, which not surprisingly means uh, pedestrians walk onto the cycle tracks and cyclists tend to sidewalk cycle around the transit shelter if someone is stopped to get into the, uh, into the bus. The problem here is cyclists see this as a cycle track. All they see there is a bike. What about this tells us that the only purpose of that race section is to safely get pedestrians over to the transit? A suggestion that I've submitted and Walk Toronto and others submitted is make that a zebra hatched area or at least mix in zebra hatching with a bike symbol. Make it very clear that to people that there's an expectation they'll do something different than just truck along a bike lane if they get to that point. So in response to your question, those are, those are just four or five things, but that's the nature of what I saw. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gord. Are there any other questions? Okay, uh, Michael, please go ahead. Okay, that's very Gordon, fascinating. Gordon, the question's for you, I think. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> please stick around. I'm, I'm just gonna say a very, fa okay, very fascinating presentation. I was just wondering though, just because a lot of this is very much new to me and probably new for other people as well, is there like a one simple solution or a simple recommendation? Because it just seems to be a whole bunch of different things. So I'm just wondering, is it like on an intersection by intersection basis or is there something that would work for everything? What would you recommend? Um, it, it, it absolutely has to be case specific. But the thing is, you don't treat each site as a new opportunity to create something. You need some kind of guidelines. I showed you the, the, the cycling and car separation guidelines. They're logical. You got all these options. Here's when you use them, here's when you don't. I think what we need is to have exactly that same kind of thing happen. If you're considering using a sidewalk level cycle track, when do you use it? What are the pros and cons? What are the demographics? When does it make sense? Exactly the same thing for um, you know, other situations, mixing areas. Once again, I don't see the need. I think it's an easy way out. And you got into that problem because you've already brought sidewalk, uh, sidewalk level cycle tracks into place. So I think that's what you need is an engineered approach that says here are the options, here are the pros and cons. These are the only instances in which you use them. Here's how you mitigate the pedestrian safety impacts, and then a follow-up plan that says the mitigating actions are actually keeping pedestrians safe. Okay, thank you. I was just gonna say one thing with that as well. I think one thing that would have been helpful for me just to sort of see things visually is you've shown the pictures, you've sort of pointed out where the problem areas were. It would have also been good as well to have like another photo, sort of like Photoshop saying, okay, these are, if we put a zebra strip here, or if we put a barrier here or trees here, it would help people sort of see things, those recommendations much more easier. Um, it's, it's an excellent point, and I hope that's what staff will be doing when they go back to take your comments. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. Anyone else for questions of the speaker? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Gordon. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to, we're gonna bring staff back to the front of the room. Um, there is an opportunity now for you to ask staff to clarify uh, anything from their presentation. Are there any questions of staff? Okay. We'll let them settle in. Uh, first questions are gonna come from Wendy and then Stephanie. 
Hi there. Um, so my question relates to some of the stuff that, that uh, Gordon has raised. And it sounds to me like there, there is another set of guidelines around pedestrians that have not necessarily been integrated with your design guidelines. Is that, is that the case? And it, can you explain what's happened in terms of there being separate sets of consideration for pedestrian versus cyclist? So I will say that in chapter three, when we discuss separation between the motor vehicle and uh, the cycle track, we also discuss separation between the pedestrian area, so the sidewalks, and the cycle track. So we look at a number of different options. Typically, we would like to have the cycle track at a different level, so that there's a curb separation, something very defined to differentiate between the sidewalk area and the cycle track area. In some cases, that's also provided by a planted buffer. So there may be actually trees in between the sidewalk and the cycle track. And in other cases, there's uh, what, it's about a 0.8 meter tain detectable strip between um, the cycle track and, and the pedestrian walking area. So that's, uh, I think it's discussed in, in section 3.1. 1.5 on uh, techniques used um, to separate between pedestrians and cyclists to ensure that all users are, are safe in both facilities. Do you have anything to add, Jason? Uh, I'll just add uh, briefly that one of the, um, one of the guidelines that Gord mentioned is the city's complete streets guidelines. And uh, they certainly were a, uh, a significant consideration as we were developing these. And uh, we sort of saw the complete streets guidelines as the overarching framework. And it provides very high level guidance in terms of principles and that kind of thing. Puts a few design ideas out there. It does not really get into specific technical detail. And so this really sort of feeds into that and provides the technical details for uh, bicycle facilities and is, uh, we think, very consistent with the Complete Streets Guidelines. Okay. Uh, thank you. Don't go away. Uh, Wendy still has questions. <laughs> yeah. I have a follow-up question, actually. So, because my question is really around the Complete Streets Guidelines and how they relate to the guidelines that you're proposing. So, if Complete Streets is out there, do you reference that in any way? Is Complete yes. Streets the parent? And in, in the case of there being a conflict between what's in Complete Streets and what's in your design document, which one is considered to be the overriding document? Right, so we do reference Complete Streets. Complete Streets is the overarching document, and then this is a very technical document that practitioners will use in terms of design and implementation. So we actually had Adam Popper on our team who did the Complete Streets guide, um, and a lot of the input from that guide is referenced in, in ours as well. Yes, go ahead, you have time. So which document takes precedence in the event of there being a conflict? Because it sounds like there were things that were discussed in the Complete Streets guideline, Guidelines that are in conflict with the kinds of things that you're talking about in this design document. So how, how do we determine which one actually takes precedence? Uh, we uh, have not actually uh, sort of specifically addressed that, partly because we, uh, we think that actually a, a direct conflict between the two is, is relatively unlikely. And I'll just quickly speak to one of the examples that, um, uh, that Gord uh, raised for us, and that is uh, in the Complete Streets Guidelines, it says, too, that mixing areas should be avoided. And if you look at what we have in our guide here, uh, you'll see that it really uh, is consistent with that and is framed as uh, an option only really to consider when, uh, when there are specific things that make uh, separated facilities not practical. And so it's, uh, we, we have pretty clear language that, uh, that anywhere where pedestrians and cyclists are separated mid-block, which would happen uh, in any location as, unless there's a spatial constraint, that they should maintain that separation on the corner and through the intersection. Thank you very much, Wendy. Um, Stephanie, to question. Thank you for the presentation. Um, forgive me, I'm new to the uh, committee. I was looking on the uh, graph where you indicated uh, we're in the consultation phase. 
what uh, I think I, I I need more understanding because I'm feeling uh, you've told us areas that are related to accessibility, um, and I guess I'm just wondering, uh, and also relating to the questions that you were posing, I I haven't seen those questions previous to today. I'm not sure if other individuals have, and I don't know if I'm a, at a point where I could give a, a concise or a really fulsome uh, answer to the three questions asked today. But um, in terms of the consultation, yeah, if that can be clarified, where are we? Where, is, where are you? <laughs> so we had hoped um, that when you received the presentation prior to this meeting, I think it was two weeks prior, that those questions were on a slide um, and that you, they were not on the slide. Um, and so that you could have provided feedback at this meeting. Um, but regardless of that, we're, you know, we're here to hear um, from you on um, your thoughts about the guide and how you, how you think we can move forward with the guide. We have done um, some internal uh, consultation through a technical advisory committee with a number of city agencies and divisions. We've also had engagement uh, with some invited stakeholders. Um, and we uh, were just recently at uh, TTC's Accessibility Committee also to receive some feedback on the guide. So we are now um, nearing uh, completion of our draft guide and would like to finalize the document come late spring, early summer. Just as a follow-up, uh, where can we locate the uh, detailed guide outside of this presentation? So the detailed guide right now uh, is available in draft. It's not in accessible format. It won't be until it's finalized, but you're welcome to uh, have a copy of that. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Glenn and then Liv. Oh, Liv was first. Okay, sorry, Liv. My apologies. Go ahead, please. Um, a couple of questions for you. First question, um, so in terms of the data collection, I just want to clarify, um, I'm aware anecdotally along the Boer bike lanes of a lot of um, incidents of cyclists and wheelchair user um, interactions that have led to injury, um, which is something nobody wants. Is There is no data collection at this point um, around the number of injuries or accidents um, arising out of uh, pedestrian slash wheelchair user, bike lane uh, user interactions? So no p specific data uh, collection, but certainly we've enhanced the guide from the lessons learned on something like a Bloor Street. So now we've enhanced with having these accessible pick up and drop off areas with very clear demarcation across the cycle track uh, with zebra crossings, very clear signage to cyclists that they're required to yield uh, when approaching one of those accessible areas. So I think we've really heard from, uh, from Bloor Street and from other examples that were brought up that there needs to be uh, this more clear, uh, uh, that, that nobody need, wants to make the decision last minute, that we need to be very clear to cyclists through signage, through markings, where they should be, when they should stop, similar at transit stops, and very clear to those that are being dropped off and picked up where, they can, where that can happen, providing ramps for that, providing uh, you know, a, a clear crossing at those locations. One of the, the challenges, I think, is that um, both with Wheeltrans and with wheelchair accessible um, vehicles, there, there aren't necessarily designated stops, right? They stop anywhere along the way uh, to, to reduce the uh, amount of distance between the person alighting and their, their uh, place of pickup. So even if you have some designated spots, I mean, a pickup can happen anywhere along the route. Um, so that it's it's concerning that there isn't a way to collect um, data about accidents arising from from that. Um, so I, I just want to note that. Um, 
In terms of uh, the separation issue um, uh, that Gord raised, again, I'm new to this, but uh, it's, it, it does seem concerning that that is still listed as an option. So I'm wondering under what circumstances would it be, um, you've, you've said it's recommended to not um, mix, under what circumstances would mixing be the only option? Typically, uh, in more suburban contexts, where there's lower volumes of both cyclists and pedestrians, and where it may be already a mixed facility on approach. So in some cases, we might have boulevard trails or multi-use trails that are mixed uh, where there's cycling and uh, walkers. And so in those instances, we, we may look to do mixing at the intersection as well. But again, lessons learned from Queen's Key and, and from others, we really now understand that there needs to, if there's separation uh, throughout mid-block, we need to maintain that separation in some way at the intersection as well. Whether it's by ramping down the cycle track, so then there's a curb separation for the pedestrians as they inter enter, or whether it's through you know very clear uh, mar markings and very dis yeah. Anyways, okay. anything? Thank to you. Add? Yeah. Um, and just one, I think I have time for one more quick one here. Um, just looking at your, your overall f phasing, um, when you're looking at the implementation phase, so ultimately a, a giant uh, report and guideline will be created and it'll be, I imagine, primarily a resource for um, those designing uh, the streetscape, engineers, street furniture, all of that. Um, in the implementation phase, is there consideration of a public education campaign um, what does that look like uh, for cyclists, for pedestrians? Um, is there planning around that? Yeah, that's interesting because that point was also brought, brought up by a number of our external stakeholders. And uh, in some ways we do some minor education through, through our website or through uh, our advo advocacy team at Cycle Toronto. But I think that maybe we need, like, like you're suggesting, maybe we need to explore a bit more, uh, given that what we're trying to develop with the guide is consistency through design. Um, so maybe adding some education elements to that would be a good point. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I would definitely recommend that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Glenn, and then Michael. I think we're at that point in time, we're going to close this off with some remarks, and then we're going to move on to our next presentation. Uh, go ahead, Glenn. Uh, like others have indicated, thank you for your uh, detailed presentation. Just a question as to enforceability, and this may be a question that is higher principle than specific to your committee. These are recommendations, these are guidelines. It seems to me that it's all too easy for the city to value engineer them out of existence when that is convenient to do so or expedient to do so. Um, where is enforceability and to what extent? You're suggesting enforceability of, of the guidelines? I think we in cycling strive to have the best facility. Um, so when we're moving forward with planning studies or with other implementation along corridor work, we'll strive to, to um, put, be very, uh, definite about what we feel is the appropriate facility type for that, for the nature of that street. Um, and we're, v we're very clear in the guidelines about what we call exemplary, what we call our typical, which is, it, which is what we would go by in general circumstance, and then very clear about when and only when we would go down to our minimum. And those need to be well documented, have mitigating measures, um, and be appropriate for the, for the spaces that they're recommended in. I ask that only because of, well, a specific example that was mentioned by Gord about at Queen's Park, where it seems your recommendation was very different from what ended up happening, or at least your department's recommendation, and it seems like, well, that's just the way it is. And we should say that Queen's Park was developed before these guidelines were developed. Um, and again, lot, lots of lessons learned with things that, things that are already in the field and we, we know we can improve upon in the future. Jason. 
Yeah, just to, to add to that, I think in many ways the, the need for the guidelines came out of a number of different circumstances or conditions where you know people weren't happy with the design yeah. and a you know desire to go through this exercise, have this process, and have some consistency. So I think it uh, kind of speaks to why, why we're here today. Thank you. Glenn, thank you. Um, Michael, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I was just going to echo a comment on what Liv was saying about the public education campaign. I think it's needed for cyclists, but also for people with disabilities, but even others as well. I remember when bike lanes were put in on Sherburn and say a wheel trans vehicle would park or nearby, they were actually ticketed by Toronto Police, for example. So I think it needs to be broad based. The other thing too that I'm wondering is that I think it's very easy for cyclists and just members of the public to ignore signage. And so I'm just wondering, have you thought of any suggestions to make that signage for lack of a better word, more colorful, more prominent, so that people can say, oh, I, I, I missed the sign. Sure, um, that is certainly something that we've, uh, we've been thinking about. Um, specific to, to the Sherborne uh, cycling facilities uh, and at transit stops, there's a do not pass open door sign. And, uh, and we've heard repeatedly that that sign is not large enough and, uh, and often, uh, goes undetected. In, in addition to that, we also know that cyclists tend to have their eyes focused on the ground uh, a lot to maneuver around obstacles, that sort of thing, which means that uh, by, through pavement markings, uh, we can often communicate more effectively sometimes than signage even. And so if you look at some of the city's more recent uh, projects, um, there's a, a cycle track on Lakeshore Boulevard in Etobicoke, you'll see that we have those sign messages reinforced through pavement markings, do not pass open doors. And uh, I'm not aware of any concrete data, but anecdotally it seems to yeah. be successful. Yeah. And, it, and in other instances, you've seen the green coloring. So we've used coloring to kind of uh, reinforce areas that, that may be of conflict or there might be interaction between users. Michael, thank you. Anyone else for questions? Okay, Miranda? Um, yes, thank you for your presentation. I'm just wondering, um, as you're talking about the markings, um, has there been any consideration in regards to night vision, um, making the signages and the markings on the pavement a little bit more um, clear in the nighttime? Uh, I would just maybe say to that that um, this is similar in, in many ways to general pavement markings and signage on roadways intended for motorists primarily. Uh, and, uh, and typically the city does use uh, products that have reflectivity. Um, what that means is that for cyclists um, during uh, nighttime conditions, if they have any sort of uh, lighting at all, then they will, uh, these pavement markings have kind of that um, uh, reflectivity that enhances uh, the visibility of them. Um, of course, if they don't have lighting, um, you yeah, know, there's not much you can do. And, and that's illegal, so the, it's an enforcement issue, really. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none. Uh, committee members to speak. Wendy, go ahead, please. I think these guidelines are extremely important for uh, people with disabilities as pedestrians. Um, you know, so we're talking about a context where there's no data on, collected on the collisions between bicyclists and uh, pedestrians, so we don't know very much about it. Although anecdotally, I think we've all heard of somebody using a wheelchair with a disability who's been hit by a bicycle. Um, you have a very well articulated cyclist on slide 13 of your presentation, but I didn't see any articulation of a pedestrian throughout your presentation. And I don't know if one exists in terms of your guidelines. Uh, if you did have an articulated pedestrian, it would have to include people with disabilities, right? So you'd have to be including somebody who uses a power wheelchair or a manual wheelchair uh, and factor into those kinds of crossing areas how long it could take somebody to get across. You'd also have to factor in somebody with a, a visual, a vision-related disability. A lot of what you've talked about in terms of your design guidelines are signs right, and visual markers that are not available to pedestrians with uh, vision-related disabilities, which makes when you have those kinds of crossing and mixing areas extremely hazardous. 
Right, so you're, you're talking about no physical separation. So somebody who uses perhaps a white cane to navigate the world could find a physical separation and be able to navigate it. But that slide that we looked at around Queen's Key where you just have a big green section where everybody's sort of fending for themselves is extremely worrying for somebody with a, a vision-based disability because where are they supposed to go? Uh, I just wonder, is there any way for uh, pedestrians to be better articulated throughout your design guides guidelines. So is there a way to revisit this, to come up with a pedestrian, to think about who the pedestrian might be, the range of kinds of disabilities that a pedestrian might present with, and consider them throughout the context of these guidelines? I think it's a rhetorical question more than anything else at this point in time. Um, can I have any other speakers? Stephanie, go ahead, please. Um, it's, it's actually further to um, Wendy's uh, point, and I, ironically, I had just, is it all right if we speak of personal circumstances? Yes, circumstance? yeah, you've got um, five minutes. So ironically, I had not been down to the Queen's Key uh, in a, many years, and uh, to my uh, last year I went, and inadvertently, as I was going to uh, cross the street, I was in the bike lane unknowingly. Uh, and I think I'm pretty astute in terms of visually knowing my circumstances and obviously uh, concern for safety of myself and others and my whereabouts. And someone actually then indicated to me, no, this is the bike lane, back up, you know, because there were street cars. So it, it is very, um, it, is a, it is a confusing intersection, but I think that that is a model that it's only going to um, get worse as our city becomes more congested, and that does become more um, uh, important for us to use, obviously, transit and, and sort of marry uh, pedestrians with uh, transportation. But the um, other concerning issue that I, I, I just felt that I wanted to indicate was with regards to the uh, separation, uh, and, and I'm sorry if I'm not using the correct terminology yet, but uh, where there's a sidewalk and then there's a uh, bike lane beside, which is on a, a different grading. I, I often find that that, uh, to me, instinctually, I, I see hazard. But that's because when I, I know when I'm driving, it's very, uh, in a wheelchair, I think it might be the angle that we're sitting on. I find it difficult to differentiate when, uh, depending upon the lighting, depending upon many different factors. And it, and it can be, um, a, a bit difficult if uh, you don't know that that's there to uh, to see. And I guess I just wanted to just point that out. And I mean, I've obviously made many workarounds. I know to stay on the inside, et cetera, which is why one of the other things I felt that was really important when people talked about training for the public and, and maybe that does mean uh, training for those with many different varieties of disabilities and also individuals who are uh, aging, slower walkers, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Anyone else? Michael, go ahead, please. Okay. My comment was just my experiences on Bloor Street as a wheel-trans user. Um, both myself and even the wheel-trans drivers had no idea where to do the pickup or drop-off at all. Um, oftentimes, the drivers, I'd be on Bloor Street, the drivers would either park, say, on Bedford or St. George, and then walk along. And, you know, it made sense in the summertime. But when there's inclement weather, or as we've talked earlier today about snow removal, that's really difficult as well, especially if there is sort of blowing snow. Um, just sort of listening to everything, it's, you know, I have to echo everyone's points as well, that it seems that there was very much a focus on cyclists, but not on people with disabilities, not on seniors. And it just seems that there are a lot of things that are very much missing though. And just the point about the number of injuries between people with disabilities and cyclists, the fact that that's not been documented anywhere, I mean, is actually quite troubling. So it just felt that there's just a lot that's missing from things. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, seeing none, I do have a quick motion. Um, I can ask the clerk to put it on the screen. And the motion is actually to just direct staff to 
uh, receive the, the communications uh, that were uh, provided to us today uh, from both Walk Toronto as well as Gord's presentation and to establish in the short time that they have left since they're heading to finalizing the report, a special consultation specifically with accessibility and pedestrian advocates to further understand the technical concerns that they have. Have that conversation guided by the Toronto Complete Streets Guideline before finalizing the report on the on-street uh, bikeway design guide. Um, I want to thank staff for their presentation. I recognize that this is a huge body of work. Um, I know it's not necessarily easy uh, simply because every road condition, every street is different. Um, and uh, as you try to deliver an outcome of best practices, um, and this document will ultimately guide the way we design all streets moving forward until we decide that we're going to tackle it again, which means a refreshed set of guidelines, um, I think it's absolutely critical that we get it right. Uh, you asked us today with three questions at the end of your presentations. Um, I don't have the presentations in the deck that's before us, which is the official uh, agenda of our committee. Those questions were not included in the presentation, even as uh, as the committee members would have received it uh, two weeks ago. Not sure why that happened, but nevertheless, it's just not there. Um, and I think that in order for the committee members, uh, as well as others who are perhaps not uh, paying attention to what's happening at this committee today, which includes people who are probably using strollers, caregivers who required uh, a way to get onto those uh, and get over those uh, bikeways, uh, pedestrians, people living with disabilities and requiring mobility devices, as well as seniors and anybody else who's just navigating the streets who are not on two wheels or four wheels um, or three wheels. Uh, or one wheel, the unicycles, uh, they're going to need to find their way, uh, find their way through the streets and be able to share the roads safely. Um, and I do think that it's critically important that we don't pit vulnerable road users against one another. We have to find a way to coexist. I know that um, in my own experience, I've had some very, um, I've been stuck in the middle of unpleasant conversations between uh, people who are requiring the service of wheel trans not being able to deboard the, the vehicle because of, um, uh, of a separated bikeway, which is of course designed and constructed there to protect the other vulnerable road user who are the cyclists. Um, so if we can find a way before you finalize this report to make it right and to, to make sure that uh, any concerns that are that are already very quickly raised by, by way of your, your 15 minute presentation, if we can find some technical solutions and make sure that you've got a full report as much as possible um, going to final adoption would I think, uh, I believe would be greatly appreciated. And simply because I think there's a number of examples that are already out there, uh, whether it's um, the conflicts on Wellesley as I've already noted or perhaps even the implementation of the Sherburn bike um, uh, separate separated bike lane, I know that created a lot of confusion, especially for the seniors uh, who lived on that street and which staff had to go back to and, and then do further consultation after the street um, at over a million dollars of construction was, was dropped in. So I think it would be a lot more, there's a better business case to get it right the first time round as opposed to coming back to then shave and grind and perhaps reconstruct but usually after a very long and conflict-driven complaint process, which leaves um, oftentimes uh, good neighbors, good people with great intentions at, at, uh, at conflict with one another. And I know I don't want to be in the middle of that. Um, and, but oftentimes we're asked to sort of mediate peace. Uh, and if there was a, a good document guiding all that design to start off with, uh, hopefully we can avoid that in the future. Um, so, uh, if there's no other speakers, let's just vote on the motion. All those in favor? And the opposed? That carries. And I don't think we need to amend the item because there were no other recommendations. Thank you, staff, for your presentation. We're almost there. Um, we have two presentations, and I know we have half an hour, um, but the last two items was pretty substantial, a lot of technical stuff. Uh, our next presentation is, uh, is uh, Accessibility Review, Toronto Vision Zero 2.0 Road Safety Plan. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Victoria, if I can ask you to come to the front. Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, and for staff, please proceed at any time.
There we go. With one minute left to noon. Good morning, everyone and committee. Um, I'm here to, my name is Shada Sanayinajad, and I'm here to talk about uh, Vision Zero 2.0, which is the update to the road safety plan. Um, I was somewhat of a late addition to the agenda, and I thank uh, the committee organizers for um, uh, adding us to today's agenda, but for that reason, I'm gonna be brief to make sure uh, the last presentation is also um, going to be able to cover their content. So, um, as you all know, Vision Zero Road Safety Plan is something we started um, mid-2016. Um, it's a five-year plan to reduce the number of traffic-related deaths and serious injuries on Toronto's roads. Um, we currently have a f list of over 50 countermeasures uh, directing, uh, sort of directed at uh, five, uh, six emphasis areas to be implemented uh, over five years uh, at the time when it was approved in 2016. Um, it, there is a, uh, the bar graph on the slide shows the trends in total uh, fatalities uh, over, since 2005. And basically what it shows is that we were somewhat of a, on a, somewhat of a downward trend um, leading to um, up to 2011. And then starting 2012, um, the numbers of fatalities on our roads have started going up, which is why we started looking at Vision Zero around mid-2016. Um, and it's particularly noticeable in the number of pedestrians as vulnerable road users uh, being involved in fatal collisions, um, serious injury and fatal collisions. So Vision Zero 2.0 is the update. Uh, so it's the first major update since the original report. Um, it's going to uh, the Environment and um, Infrastructure and Environment Committee in June and then Council in July. Um, it, is, it sets the plan for the, the, the five years starting 2020 to 2024. And it will provide both an update in terms of what we have accomplished so far to date since the original plan was approved and, and came into motion, and also what some of the major, um, the key initiatives moving forward are gonna be. Um, the report is being developed through detailed data analysis as well as stakeholder engagement activities that are underway. So as I mentioned, part of the report is going to cover what we've accomplished so far. 2018 was the year we accomplished the most um, uh, since the report was approved. Um, all the accomplishments will be covered as a part of the report, but I'm, I'm going to highlight maybe a couple of the relevant ones for this committee. We've installed a 80 leading pedestrian intervals in 2018, and those are where a pedestrian gets a head start when they're crossing at signalized intersections. Um, we installed 53 senior safety zones, which are zones that have um, heightened sort of level of awareness for uh, drivers in terms of uh, speeding and attention to, um, to all pedestrians, including seniors. Um, 86 accessible pedestrian signals installed, and we continue to do that uh, every year. Um, we have an annual sidewalk, sidewalk inspection program uh, that, again, was completed this year, which, which the, the result of the inspection uh, is repairs to the sidewalks where there are um, deficiencies in uh, sidewalk level. Um, one of the main aspects of Vision Zero 2.0 is that it's going to be a lot more data driven. So we're trying to really use data to focus our attention to and try, try to get the biggest bang for the buck in terms of reducing the number of uh, fatalities and serious, serious injuries. Um, I will probably um, highlight a few components of the data analysis. We're looking at um, demographics data. We're rooting, root, looking at the types of road users that are, um, that are involved in serious injury and fatal collisions. When you see the term KSI in the slides, that's what they're referring to, killed and serious injury collisions. Um, uh, as I mentioned, we have six emphasis areas, so we're delving, uh, looking uh, at each of those emphasis areas and trying to understand the trends within each emphasis area. Uh, they include uh, seniors, pedestrians, cyclists, school age children, distracted driving, and motorcyclists. Um, we, this time around, we're looking at not only the age of victims involved in uh, serious injury and fatal collisions, but also the age of drivers in order to inform our um, upcoming education campaigns around uh, making sure people, uh, distracted driving doesn't result in um, serious injuries and fatalities. Um, and also looking at um, where a lot of most of the KSIs are happening, finding, uh, we're finding that 85 to 90 percent of serious injuries and fatalities on our arterial roads. So doing this kind of analysis, again, in order to be more effective with our efforts and direct them to where the issues are. So 
As a part of our uh, data analysis, um, I want to share some of our preliminary findings that are specific to Scarborough. The Scarborough district, as one of the four districts, we, we've noticed that is often overrepresented in the number of uh, serious injuries and fatalities, especially amongst pedestrians. So we were uh, tasked with looking at what are the factors that contribute to that. So. Um, one of the things we've noticed is that, yes, the disparities are amongst pedestrians and especially in mid-block pedestrian collisions. So when a pedestrian is trying to cross the road uh, where there's no protected signalized pedestrian crossing. So looking into that and trying to understand why we've, uh, and, and none of this is probably to anyone's surprise, but Scarborough has the longest length of high-speed arterials in the city. Scarborough has the longest walking distance um, between safe signalized pedestrian uh, uh, crossing opportunities and the longest length of wide arterials. So all of those factors contribute to mid-block crossings becoming high risk. So mid-block crossings happen uh, all across the city, and they're not necessarily a high-risk uh, behavior. Uh, but there are circumstances in Scarborough and in other suburban uh, locations in the city that contribute to some of those mid-block crossings becoming high risk and uh, ending up in fatalities or serious injuries. So we're, we're trying to, again, uh, take a data-driven approach to understanding what those contributors are and then addressing them, which I'll cover in the next slide. Um, and uh, the only other point to mention is that uh, people with physical disabilities are especially uh, affected by this mid-block mid crossing issue because if it's, if it's hard for someone without any uh, physical disabilities to take the extra walk to the nearest traffic signal, then it's even harder for someone with disabilities. So in terms of some of the key uh, initiatives, we've obviously noticed that speed is a main contributing factor to a lot of the fatalities. So you might have a collision, but it doesn't have to end up in a fatality or serious injury if the speeds are not that high. So we're paying special attention uh, to speed and coming up with a speed management strategy, which is comprised of a number of uh, components. Geometric roads modifications is one of the main components. We know that, that it's one of the most effective ways of um, uh, encouraging people to drive uh, slower. That said, it's also one of the more expensive and more complicated ways of uh, sort of changing the road, and it takes a lot of time. But we want to give more attention to that. Automated speed enforcement is something we 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 have we're working on getting the the sort of the permissions from the provincial level and being able to roll them out slowly across the city. High visibility targeted uh, police enforcement is something we're working with Toronto Police as a part of Vision Zero 2.0 uh, to be able to sort of um, complement the automated speed enforcement program. Speed limit reductions at targeted locations are always uh, one of the tools in the toolbox and, and we're trying to combine them with other aspects in order to make other components of the speed management strategy in order to make sure they're effective. Um, I mentioned uh, education campaigns, so effective broad reaching public uh, outreach and education. And, uh, and the other component is digital speed feedback signs, also known as watch, known as watch your speed signs, uh, that are known and we've studied them and we know that they're effective in reducing speeds. Their, their deployment is limited to roads with a lower number of travel lanes, because you have once you have uh, more than four travel lanes or more than two lanes in each direction, um, they can't pick out the vehicle that's approaching them, so the information, the number they show is not as accurate and people won't know what they're responding to. Um, outside of speed management, uh, the, before I go to the next bullet, geometric road modifications affect safety, uh, affect speed, uh, but they also, um, in general, uh, one of the main components of them is that um, they re reduce crossing distances, which again reduces the amount of risk that a pedestrian is exposed to um, because they're, they're spending a lower amount of time and distance on uh, the road exposed to live traffic, which again um, benefits all pedestrians, but also those who are more mobility challenged and, and um, move slower. We also, so I mentioned mid-block crossings are gonna be a, a major component of our uh, focus. And so as a part of that, we're having a look at our existing warrant systems for um, assessing a location for a traffic signal, for either a pedestrian-only traffic signal or a signalized intersection that 
provides the safe crossing for pedestrians. Uh, as a part of that, we're looking at components like uh, whether there is a slope uh, in order for a pedestrian, like does a pedestrian have to go uphill in order to reach a safe crossing? Uh, that's one of the many different factors we were looking at to uh, justify why a location might be warranted for, a, uh, for an additional crossing. Um, Additional pedestrian head start features, so that's the leading pedestrian interval um, feature that I mentioned at Signals, and we're gonna expand those extensively over the next few years. Um, red light cameras are being doubled by 2020, which again uh, addresses some of the red light uh, running issues. And um, I haven't listed it here, but as I mentioned, a accessible pedestrian signals, we, we're gonna continue to uh, roll them out. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention is that the Vision Zero team will continue to work with our internal accessibility advisory panel for transportation services, which is a group where we go to when we have um, sort of uh, complex um, design issues that we need to sort of uh, resolve when it comes to the road um, operation and design. Uh, we would also come back to this committee when we have individual uh, Vision Zero road safety related uh, actions that we're trying to sort of wrap our hearts around and develop guidelines or designs or implementation plans. So what I'm here present to present today is quite sort of broad because we're talking about the Vision Zero 2.0 update as a whole and, and as we, uh, we pilot new things or we're, we introduce new concepts like the, the on-street bike lane um, presentation that we had previous to me, we will be coming back to this committee or other uh, venues to consult with the accessibility community. And I think that's Thank you very much for the presentation. Are there any questions? Okay, uh, ooh, there's lots of questions. Uh, I'm gonna start with Michelle. Uh, and then head over to Wendy, Michael, and I believe Stephanie. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is specifically around the accessible pedestrian signals. So those are the buttons that you push to get the auditory signal to safely cross the street. Uh, I've noticed since they've been installed that the volume varies uh, based on the geographical area or intersection. And sometimes it's quite difficult to hear the signal uh, to note across. So when I'm with folks with low vision, they'll still have to depend on me to guide them based on the visual uh, changes to the light. So I'm wondering if you can explain why uh, there is that issue. Um, I will give a quick answer and then uh, direct to my colleague Lee Shirkin, who knows a lot more about this than I do. But the volume does uh, fluctuate based on, there's a sensor that measures how much sound there is in the environment and the volume goes up when the sound is up. But maybe I'll, I'll let Hi, sorry. Um, yep, uh, Cheda's right. It's uh, it, it does respond to the ambient noise. So if there's a really big truck that goes by, for example, it'll it'll change it. But it's not always perfect. So I would say if there's recurring problems uh, at certain intersections, either let someone here know or through on one it. It sounds terrible, but it creates a ticket, and then we'll send an inspector out just to test to make sure there's nothing wrong with the mechanisms. Thank you, Thank you. Um, Wendy. I wanted to ask a question about the, the demographics piece of the sort of collision data that you collect. It sounded like you were talking about a few categories of pedestrians, right? So you said children, seniors, um, I think there were a few other categories there, but there, were no, there was no persons with disabilities category. And I just wanted to mention that and ask if you could speak to it, in particular in light of your comment around people with disabilities being um, particularly impacted by the mid-block crossing. So is that something that could be considered? Is, has, there been, has it been considered and, and uh, thought to not be appropriate? Um, no, so it's definitely considered in every one of our countermeasures that we look at. It's, it wasn't identified as one of the emphasis areas because when we were, when we were looking at the, sort of the, the number of KSIs, um, it's not, it didn't sort of you know surface to the top, but that's not to say that it's not an um, important sort of group of users to look at. Um, the other thing, the other issue is sometimes around data. So the data that we get from Toronto Police is not at always as um, sort of high quality as we would like it in terms of um, giving us the indication of when a person is involved in a collision uh, of varying types, whether or not they had a disability, to, in order for us to understand better uh, how much um, people with disabilities are overrepresented or not uh, within um, our traffic collisions. But that said, even with, without with the lack of adequate data, we continue to um, sort of consider people with disabilities in every one of our 
uh, the safety countermeasures and designs. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Can Our, I ask a follow up? You have more questions? When, yeah, follow up. Yeah, go ahead, you have time. Um, can, can that, so, you know, you're saying part of the question is, or part of the problem is that you don't get the data back from the, from the police about whether a person with a disability was involved in a collision. But your categories are things like seniors and, you know, um, it's interesting to me that seniors would be something that you would be collecting consciously, but not people with disabilities. So again, I'm just wondering if that's something that could be considered. We, certainly, sorry, I forgot to include that in my first answer. Uh, yes, so we're working on a memorandum of on understanding with Toronto Police in order to collect that kind of additional information. Because um, yes, seniors is easily collected because of the age of the person involved, but um, this factor isn't as well. And, and we have sort of un acknowledged that it's a missing piece and we're working with police to report it in incident reports. Uh, thank you very much, Wendy. Uh, Michael, to question. Okay, thank you. Uh, a couple of quick questions. Uh, number one, just off of Wendy's question about the distinction between seniors and people with disabilities, you could have a senior who's also a person with a disability if they're using a mobility device. So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, I'm sort of surprised that there is that kind of a distinction being made though that uh, you would almost say they're, they're both. Um, so I'm kind of curious about that. The other questions that I was asking or thinking about as well is that there are some intersections where depending on the time of day, it'll give a different length of time. So say midday, it'll be like 15 seconds to cross, but during rush hour, it's like 25. And when I've inquired about it, I've never been able to find out, well, what time does it start? What time does it not start? So I'm wondering if that's something um, that you've looked at as well. And last but not least, when you've looked at the data, you make uh, time-specific points. So there seemed to have been a bit of a spike starting in 2012. So I'm just wondering if there was something that happened in 2012 that sort of resulted in that spike. And are there other factors such as the change um, from daylight savings time to standard time, do you see an extra spike when it's darker? Uh, yeah, okay, so um, to address your first question, there are definitely overlaps between the different emphasis areas. So, for example, we have a uh, uh, school age children and there's an overlap between that and pedestrians and there's an overlap between the pedestrian emphasis area and seniors. So, we're, the, it's the emphasis areas are just a way to sort of um, direct our focus to the different. Okay user groups. Um, in terms of your question about the uh, signals, you should be able to get information about um, when a, a particular signal switches its operation from uh, one mode to the other, and, and you could request that from the city. I could, I could give you the contacts to reach out to. Uh, but yes, it's, 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 a, it's a factor of when a signal, uh, when rush hour traffic starts, the, 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 the amount of time each of the directions is provided changes, which then results in changing the amount of the, the countdown seconds. That said, there's a minimum amount of walk time and countdown time that always should be provided, and those are always kept as it's based on the pedestrian crossing speed. Um, the last question uh, about the spike to daylight savings, we absolutely see that every year, that that's around the time of the year when we notice uh, increases. And knowing that, uh, the police has a campaign and City of Toronto has a campaign uh, right before that where we go out and, and try to do an education for both drivers and other road users to be mindful of one another. Um, in terms of what happened at, in 2012 uh, that started the spike, um, we, different people are trying to study, study the same uh, question. Um, one, of the, one of the possibilities is the sort of the rise of sort of uh, more, uh, re more opportunities for a driver to be distracted uh, in a vehicle with the use of sort of technology, but that's just one one of the hypotheses out there. Um, there's no direct sort of results as part of the research. And just very quickly, I was thinking about that idea of the time signals. Maybe putting something on a website might be helpful as well, whether it's the Vision Zero website or like a city website, it would be accessible for people to find. Okay, okay. thank you. Yep. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, Stephanie. Thank you. Um, can you just, uh, have one question relating to uh, geograph geometric road modifications. Could you just explain a little bit about what that would be? Yes, so they involve things like 
um, at, uh, reducing the turning radius, the curb radius at a corner in order to, to sort of encourage drivers to uh, drive more slowly, but it also provides more pedestrian uh, circulation space. It also makes the crossing distance shorter for pedestrians. Adding uh, bump outs at a, at a corner, which again results in shorter crossing distances. Um, adding uh, bump outs mid-block at locations where you have mid-block pedestrian crossings. So anything that involves physically modifying the, the design of the road, uh, on a bigger scale, it might involve uh, completely moving the curb alignment on a segment of the road uh, to make it narrower or um, or add bicycle lanes and all of that. Um, I just have a second question. I actually used to live in Scarborough, so you're absolutely right. It's very difficult to, you want to get all your seconds in when you start crossing the road because the more majority are four lane, at least when I was crossing. Um, and I'm just, and I'm assuming that you indicated that there was a higher incident in the Scarborough area. Um, what would be some of the solutions, and I'm thinking uh, relating to speed reduction specifically, and how difficult is that to obtain? Yeah, uh, which is why uh, we're sort of looking at a multi-pronged strategy for uh, speed. Specifically on police enforcement, we're going to focus on Scarborough first, for example. Um, we're looking at uh, lane widths as one of the many sort of tools we have in the toolbox in terms of when you modify lane widths and make it more um, sort of context sensitive, it, it does uh, encourage drivers to drive slowly. In general, uh, the kinds of solutions we want to look at are the ones we know are most effective, which are the ones that um, naturally invite uh, a, someone to drive slower as opposed to just putting up a speed limit reduction sign that is often ignored, especially if the road is designed for someone to drive fast. The speed limit sign is quite meaningless to, to them and to anyone. Fantastic. Thank you. Anyone else to speak to uh, ask questions? Seeing none. Uh, members to speak. All satisfied. Wendy, go ahead. I just wanted to come back to the demographic piece a little bit. So, uh, and just clarify. It sounds to me like you said that. Um, Turn that into a speech. I know it's a talk. I know. Okay. So I would encourage the collection of this data in terms of people with disabilities and their representation around these kinds of collisions. I think what you heard from some of the committee members is that the distinction between a senior and a person with a disability might be kind of an artificial thing based on age only when actually what you're talking about is somebody that also uses a walker or some kind of adaptive technologies, which would also make them a person with a disability. So I think it would be very... Um, I think it would it would be very helpful to collect that data, in part because you know when we're talking about the safety of people with disabilities, and we talk about it a lot at this committee, we talk about it in terms of the sidewalk snow clearance, uh, we talk about it in terms of construction and people with disabilities trying to get around. It becomes a very difficult story to articulate. We know that people with disabilities are less safe on our roads, uh, but it becomes very difficult to articulate that without data. And so I think, you know, in terms of encouraging you to pursue this uh, memorandum that you're pursuing with the police, it would be very helpful to us as a community who are trying to ensure that the streets are safe for us uh, to be able to have that kind of data to rely on too. And I can see that it would be very helpful in terms of, of uh, Vision 2.0 as well. Thank you very much, Wendy. Michael to speak. I was just going to say, just as a follow-up to what I said earlier, several jurisdictions such as British Columbia and Washington State and Oregon and California are actually considering eliminating daylight savings times just because of that very issue of the spike in collisions. Don't know if that's part of the mandate, but you know, based on what you're saying, data-driven, that might be something that could be considered as a possible solution. Thank you, Michael. Anyone else? No? Okay. I'll, we will probably need a motion uh, to receive the, rec, uh, the presentation from staff. Can I have someone? Thank you, Stephanie. Um, all those in favor of receiving the presentation? Any opposed? That carries. Thank you, staff, for the presentation. Um, we have five minutes left to the meeting, and uh, unfortunately, we will not be able to give um, the next uh, presenter the time that he deserves. Uh, the topic is very important. I want to make sure that we can actually give full consideration to the world of 
automated vehicles. Um, so I'm going to move that we defer item uh, DI 1.7, accessibility feedback on preparing the City of Toronto for automated vehicles uh, to the next meeting of TAC and to have that item heard at the very beginning of the agenda. Uh, all those in favor of the deferral? Any opposed? That carries. Um, and Ryan, thank you very much for your patience. You've been wonderful. Uh, you got a flavor of what we're about. So next time around, we'll see you um, and look forward to your presentation. Um, just by way of just a little bit of housekeeping, uh, Liv asked me a question at the beginning of the meeting about whether or not the City of Toronto is intending to, to declare an Autism Awareness Month. Uh, the answer from Barbara Sullivan from the protocol office is no, uh, there was a request from community organizations to declare um, an Autism Awareness Day, so we've done that. Uh, but uh, I recognize that that is, a, uh, that is still an event out there. Uh, we could uh, possibly, and the mayor did sign a proclamation to that effect, to the Autism Awareness Day. Uh, we, could, um, uh, we could make a request to a community organization to declare that, uh, but it would have to come from a community group. Um, so I just wanted to give you that information. You want to respond to, okay. Um, uh, 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 sure, go ahead. So the distinction is actually between Autism Awareness Day and Autism Acceptance Month. At the Acceptance Month, is a, it comes um, from within the community, from advocates who are actually autistic, rather than from um, community organizations that support people with autism, it's a, it's a, 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 just a distinction there. So that, that was the question whether um, there would be any, uh, so I, that can be taken back to the community, but that's, that was the distinction. They're, they're two sort of uh, related but different uh, responses to um, autism. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much for that clarification. Um, and uh, if you could take that back to the community, I'm sure that we would love to be able to, to give the recognition uh, to that day that it deserves here at City Council. Um, but there is nothing officially f f left on the calendar for that. Um, and uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, Michael, I understand it's your birthday. Is that true? Thank you, Michael, for spending your birthday with us. And we uh, salute you and happy birthday from TAC. Um, that brings us to the end of this uh, meeting. Thank you very much. Your contributions were incredibly valuable, very helpful. Uh, each and every single one of you uh, provided some very good con um, uh, feedback, and we will look forward to seeing you uh, at the next meeting. Okay. Meeting adjourned. Let me, um, I just want to also, sorry folks, if I can just have your attention one more time. I recognize that the chatter, if I can just have your attention, sorry, the, the meeting is pretty much over, but I do, I, I, please forgive me, I forgot to say thank you um, again to uh, Marlene Finnegan, uh, who <laughs> did a fantastic job of captioning, uh, but also Victoria for, uh, for taking good care of us. Thank you.